Thank you all for coming to this talk. Uh, I'm Li Chen, a scholar of Chinese law and history and a faculty member at the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see many of you returning to the second uh, talk of our international speaker series entitled Rethinking Cultural Constructions of Law in East Asia. And also it's uh, wonderful to welcome uh, the new <laughs> attendance to our uh, series. As most of you have already uh, known, uh, Professor Tai Zhang and I have organized this series uh, to promote more fruitful conversations and collaboration among scholars interested in East Asian legal cultures and histories. When we first started, uh, th thought about this uh, possibility, we thought it would be a research conferences, conference. But the, what happened with, the, with regard to the COVID situation has uh, compelled, but also enabled us to explore new opportunities and new ways of scholarship as well as international scholarly communications. So we turned that potential conference into a series of research talks and have made it open to the global community of scholars. And we believe that we have indeed attracted scholars from literally all over the world. So far, more than 730 people have registered for the series. And I think based on some of the, you know, probably partial data we have about the first talk, somewhat uh, about 900 people actually viewed uh, at least part of the talk, the first talk at the other uh, Chinese online platform as well. Uh, we hope that many of you will find the talks interesting and also this new, uh, I guess, format of international scholarly communications and conversations also helpful in part of overcoming some of the traditional obstacles to this kind of international scholar cl scholarly co collaboration. And certainly you are more than welcome to continue to attend our future monthly talks. I also would like to acknowledge our gratitude to the three co-sponsoring uh, research institutions, University of Toronto and also the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, Cornell Law School and Yale Law School. And I also want to thank my co-organizer, Professor Tai Su Zhang and his assistant, Marilyn, for the wonderful work they have put into the organization of this series and some of my grad students. Uh, today it is my great pleasure to introduce the speaker and our uh, com commentators. Uh, today's speaker is also my co-organizer, Professor Tai Su Zhang. Uh, Tai uh, Dr. Tai Su Zhang received his JD and PhD from Yale University, is currently a professor of law at Yale Law School, and works on comparative legal and economic history, private law theory, and contemporary Chinese law and politics. His first book, The Laws and Economics of Confucianism, Kinship and Property in Pre-Industrial China, England, published by Cambridge University Press in 2017, received the 2018 President's Award of the Social Science History Association. He has, been, he has since been working on his second book project entitled The Ideological Foundations of the Qing Fiscal State. That's also the topic of his talk today. I'm also very delighted to introduce two very accomplished commentators for today's talk. Uh, Dr. Aziz Rana is an endowed chair professor of law at Cornell Law School. He received his JD from Yale Law School and his PhD in political science from Harvard University. His research and teaching center on American constitutional law and political development with a particular focus on how shifting notions of race, citizenship, and empire have shaped the legal and political identity since the founding of the United States. Besides a series of articles, his publications include a monograph, The Two Faces of American Freedom, published by Harvard University Press 2010, in 2010. And also our other commentator, Dr. Yuhua Wang, is an, uh, an, an associate professor in the Department of Government at Harvard University. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan. And his research has been about the emergence and constraints of state institutions with a regional focus on China. Among his other publications, he is also the author of Tying the Autocrat's Hands, The Rise of the Rule of Law in China, published by Cambridge University Press in 2015. He's currently working on a book-length project to examine long-term state development in China. Uh, before we start, let me also briefly reiterate some of the logistic details or, and the format of this uh, talk. We have allocated about 40 to 45 minutes for our speaker and 10 to 15 minutes for each of the commentators. Uh, hopefully there will be about 40 to 45 minutes for the Q&A session. If a lot of questions have not been covered before 12, before noon, 
uh, if the speaker and the commentator are willing to stay a bit longer, we can extend it by 10 to 15 minutes, but uh, we don't have to do that. Uh, once the speaker starts, uh, we request all people in the audience to mute themselves throughout the whole uh, event. And we also suggest they submit their questions to the chat room. Uh, Marilyn will help us uh, collect the questions for us. And also, please keep your questions focused and concise. Uh, I will try to be uh, strict with the time limits, just to make sure that we will have enough time for meaningful discussions. Uh, I will signal to the speaker or the commentator when there is only five minutes or one minute uh, remaining or when the time is over. Uh, if Tyson and Marilyn uh, don't have other logistic details to add, uh, I will invite Tyson to start. All right, so this is um, the book project that I've been working on for pretty much the past five years. Uh, it's edging towards, I think, the later stages. Uh, first draft is something like 80% written at this point. I'm, I'm going through revisions and going through the review process in Cambridge. Uh, should be under contract relatively soon, and the book will, will likely come out in probably two years. All right, so the, the book is set up as kind of like, it's the second book in a planned trilogy of books on what Ken Pomeranz and others have called the so-called Great Divergence. Um, it, basically, like, you know, like, this is much too big a topic for especially a scholar at the relative start of his career to actually attack, uh, attack one, one book. So instead of like trying to write one big book on this, that would be probably career suicide as well. Um, I decided to kind of ease into it by writing a trilogy of books. Um, obviously, as most of you guys know, the, this is one of the kind of like timeless, eternal topics in history and sociology, political science, economics. It's, it's one of the, the, the rise of the West is always probably, probably like one of the biggest topics. Uh, the literature is massive, you know, like going from Ken to Bin Wang to Joel Mulcair, Bob Allen, earlier, you know, Doug North, Klosky, Hoffman, Philip Huang, uh, Andre Gunder Frank, Jack Goldstone, so on and so forth. Right? And then going all the way back, you know, this, this, this was a major occupation of people like Weber, Polanyi, uh, Whitfogel, and so on and so forth. Like this, this is one of the never ending topics in Chinese history. Um, that said, right, like the way that the field has been moving in recent years, um, and, and in some ways, I pro like one of the most economically sophisticated accounts of the divergence right now is probably like the one that you see coming out from, say, Bob Allen, um, where basically like a lot of emphasis is put on institutions and economic institutions, but the, 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 economic, the economic impact of those institutions is largely measured on their impact on, say, labor costs, right? So, so Allen's theory is basically that um, the reason why China didn't industrialize as fast as the West was that labor was too cheap in China. And therefore, that um, you know, entrepreneurs and business owners lacked the incentive to invest in labor-saving technologies and didn't have enough, um, therefore, like innovative pressures placed on the economy. Um, now, of course, as people have pointed out, especially Joel Mulcair has been arguing this for years, um, this account is fundamentally, inc fundamentally incomplete um, without an equal amount of attention paid to capital accumulation, which as of the current moment, there is relatively little in the existing literature or the uh, kind of like active current literature. And the reason for, the, the reason why capital accumulation is important, of course, is that you know, if you think about your incentives to invest in capital, say, in labor saving technologies, it doesn't depend on the pure price of labor. It depends on the relative price of labor vis-a-vis capital. Um, so apart from having an account of labor costs and so on and so forth, um, and having an account of basically the demand side pressures um, of this labor capital uh, balance, you also have to think about the supply side, which is how much capital actually is there and how easy it is it to actually accumulate capital in the economy. Uh, and so this is where kind of like, um, my thinking comes in. Obviously, we're not going to summarize any of this today. It's just, this is just to kind of like flag the issues for you guys and explain to you why this stuff matters to me. Um, so my kind of intuition coming into this entire debate is that much of this problem had, like much of the Chinese economy's problems with industrialization, and you see this quite, visi uh, quite, quite uh, visibly after like 1870, going all the way to the 1950s and 60s is it, 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 it had relatively low levels um, of capital accumulation um, for a major economy at that time in the world. 
And that was a major hamper, and that, that was a major obstacle to its industrialization, its path towards industrialization. Now, if you look at pre-industrial economies, right, there are basically three paths towards, towards capital accumulation. Um, most states take one or two of these paths. Some, like the U.S., had kind of all three available to its, to it. But all you need is one. Um, and these three paths are you know, like what, what I call organic snowballing. This is basically you know, like larger landowners buying land off, off of smaller landowners. And you know, land was obviously the most important economic asset in a pre-industrial economy, right? So eventually land ownership and wealth in, this, in society snowballs to a point where you have these large concentrations of wealth uh, in the hands of like a relatively small number of entrepreneurs who are highly active and they invest that capital. Um, into industrialization. Like probably the best example of this is what you see in England um, between 1550 and 1700. The second model of capital accumulation is top-down is top-down state-driven accumulation, right? state governmental extraction. You see this in Japan, you see this in Germany, uh, France to some extent, also in England after 1720. And here the state plays the major kind of like drive, plays the plays the, part, the dominant role. In, in, in capital accumulation by taxing really heavily, excluding lots of wealth, in some cases borrowing, and then it, it, it turns, out, turns around and invests that, that accumulated wealth um, into these new industries. Um, and finally, there's the possibility of joint ventures, right? So if you don't have a ton of like major, a ton of like capital accumulation within individual business entities, well, you can have joint ventures, right? Um, so a couple of mid-sized capital holders can pull their assets into one big, um, cap, uh, one big business that has the requisite, um, requisite econ economies of scale that would make industrial technologies and innovation um, economically attractive. So basically, you know, if, if you trace like, you know, the countries on their path towards industrialization, at virtually in every single case, right, with, with, with as far as I know, no exceptions, something like 50 to... 60 years before industrialization, you will, you will observe this massive buildup um, of capital in the economy. Now, and again, you don't need all three of these paths, but all you need really is one. But the argument that I want to push is China actually had none of these. Um, and so, so the first, so hence you see this through, through the three book structure. The first book that came out uh, to, to, you know, almost three years ago at this point, is about basically the lack of organic snowballing on the ground. The second book, which I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today, is about the difficulty of state extraction. And the third book, we'll pull all that, all that together, plus some, some discussion of corporate law into kind of like a, a final cohesive argument about the impact of capital accumulation on industrialization. All right, so that's the general motivation. The specific motivation for this, uh, this book was, of course, the late imperial Chinese state, you know, the Qing state was unusually weak and poor. And this is true both horizontally and vertically, right? So if you compare China with its major contemporary competitors, you know, the Japanese states, the Russians, um, even if you extend yourself a little bit more, looking, you look at the, the English, the French, and you know, other major land-based economies in the world around this time, the, the Americans, even the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Qing was pretty much an extreme outlier uh, in how little it taxed, right? So, you, so the, on, this, on, this, on this page, you're, like, I, I give you some basic, some basic senses um, of how, how these economy, economies line up. Or Japan was, an unusual, was a fairly high, highest tax state. Um, given the era, it was you know, as it, as an, as a share of annual GDP, the state tax uh, clearly over over fifteen percent every single year, even in the early years of the um, of the Meiji state. Very like later on, it, it went up to more than twenty five percent. China hovered around two percent by most estimates, and if you actually look at mainly agricultural taxes, it actually goes even further down to basically less than one percent um, by around nineteen hundred. Um, you compare this with England. England was about was pretty much where Japan was, 15-20 percent. Uh, large land-based countries like France or the U.S. taxed a little bit light, more more lightly. With they're kind of in, in the seven seven to ten percent range. Um, the Russians, which you know, like a, which are a large land-based empire like the Chinese are, uh, taxed something in the range of six to eight percent in mo across most of the later 19th century. The Ottoman Empire at this point was around five percent. 
annually. All right, so, so, so even compared to these other, other Asiatic land-based empires, China was unusually low. Um, so, so yeah, this is summarizing all of this stuff. And even more surprising, right, like, um, is that if you look at the main chunk of Chinese uh, governmental income in the Qing, which for until something like 1880 was the agricultural tax, um, compared, like, many other, so many of many other of these like early modern states make a move to kind of de-emphasize agricultural taxation um, as other avenues of taxation become available to them. Like once you have access to robust that robust streams of like you know indirect commercial taxes, you rely a little bit less on agricultural taxes. But nonetheless, if you're a pre-industrial economy, right, then the agriculture is going to be the main chunk of your economy. And if that's the case, then not being able to effectively tax agriculture, ag tax agriculture means that you won't be able to really like, you know, effectively generate income, um, at least until commercial taxes really take off um, and become the backbone of your fiscal system. Right? So, so all of these other um, fiscal systems, uh, pretty much at least through the first, like um, from, from up to like 100 years before industrialization, up to like 50 years afterwards, um, agricultural taxes are, are usually always at least going up. They may become less important over time, but they are, they're still kind of going up because you need that to fund, to fund the kind of like administrative infrastructure investments that you want um, to be able to tax other sectors of the economy. So the Qing's main kind of like real strangeness is that the agricultural tax, which is the bulk of their tax system for most of the dynasty, like more than 200 years, um, basically was locked in place and not merely as a matter of tax rate, it was locked in place as a matter of absolute volume. And at the same time, the agrarian economy basically triples over the same period. So agricultural taxes go from slightly below 5% to basically 1%. Um, and 1% or slightly more than that um, in, the, in the later 19th century. And this is needless to say, extremely strange behavior because usually we think of governments having a clear incentive to maximize their, their, their fiscal revenue. Um, so then, you know, like, you might think, oh, maybe, maybe this is just, the Qing is just like a, kind of like, it's just Chinese, right? Like, you know, well, we, we could debate whether how Chinese it actually is. But perhaps in fiscal behavior, like, it mimics trends in other Chinese dynasties. Um, this too, it turns out not to be true, right? Um, every other major Chinese dynasty from the Han Dynasty onwards um, basically manages to significantly expand its, its absolute, the absolute sum um, of its fiscal revenue from pretty much like mid dynasty onwards. What tends to happen in the Chinese dynastic cycle is, you know, early on in the dynasty, you take over after a period of unrest and warfare, <coughs> you want to give the economy some breathing room to, to kind of restore itself. So you tax relatively light. Um, once the restoration is in effect and you have a robust recovery, right? By around mid dynasty, you realize you're dealing with a growing population, a growing economy. Um, you have more room to tax. And on the other hand, if you don't tax more, um, you're not going to be able to expand the bureaucracy um, to basically keep up uh, with the population. Right? So, so basically, every major dynasty before the Qing uh, undergoes a significant fiscal expansion around mid dynasty just to, just to keep, up with, keep up with its own population. You see this in the Ming. Um, the Ming is relatively fiscally conservative for the first hundred years. Um, but after that, as the bureaucracy begin, begins, be, begins to show obvious signs of strain under population pressures, um, the Ming starting from something like around 1500, um, actually 1450 actually, um, begins to experiment with a series of you know, provincial local fiscal expansionary measures. And by the kind of mid 16th century, um, 16th century uh, begins to quite aggressively expand. For, from as a man, as a matter of like central fiscal policy, and of course, like by the late Ming, uh, because they're fighting these campaigns in the northeast, you know, like the the, the infamous Sanxia, the, the three campaign the, the three campaign taxes in the late Ming, um, dramatically ramp up the state's fiscal capacity. Um, other dynasties, the Tang and the Song, pretty much do the same thing. Um, the Song is the only Chinese dynasty to rely on indirect non agricultural taxation, which means that from around like um, 1080 onwards, um, the Song's main fiscal base is not agriculture, instead it's like commercial, com uh, commercial consumption taxation. 
Uh, nonetheless, it has following the previous pattern of, you know, like you shift towards non-agricultural taxation, but at the same time, because, you know, like your, your, your agrarian economy is still growing, um, for most of the Song, especially when they're, when they're waging major, um, major military campaigns, um, ag agricultural taxes still go up for most of the dynasty. They become less important, certainly. Um, but certainly, especially during the earlier phases of the transition to indirect taxation, um, agricultural taxes are basically providing the, the surplus that the state uses to invest in administrative infrastructure and reform so that they can actually tax things like commerce and consumption. Of all of these dynasties, the Qing breaks the pattern, right? It's the only dynasty that around mid-dynasty, it actually debates amongst its, uh, its political elite debate amongst themselves whether they, they want to expand taxation and the answer is resounding no. Like we cannot do this question that we want to ask in this, in, in this book is why. Right. And you know, even within the Qing fiscal system, right? So, and this is where we begin to kind of narrow down the question. The agricultural tax was treated differently um, from non-agricultural taxes, right? <coughs> <coughs> non-agricultural taxes, for kind of like a lack of a better word, they behave kind of rationally, right? So they start from a very low base in the 1650s uh, because of the massive economic devastation of the Ming Qing transition, uh, but then they grow, right? They grow from the 1650s to the 1840s, um, especially, you know, things like the salt tax and tariff income you know, steadily and slowly grow, trend upwards throughout this entire thing, largely keeping a pace with kind of like demographic, uh, demographic and economic recovery, right? Um, so as the kind of commercial economies expanded, so did commercial taxes. Well, as salt production scaled up, so did salt taxes. Um, so for the most part, this kind of non, this, this non-agricultural tax sector of the Qing fiscal state grew. And after 1850, of course, um, after the Taiping and after the Qing was thrown into this like, deep fiscal crisis, um, these taxes, right, these non these non agricultural taxes, become the backbone of the Qing's attempt to basically regain some kind of like some basic measure of fiscal stability. Um, they didn't respond to escalating fiscal demand after 1850. They ramp up really dramatically. Now, agricultural taxes, as we discussed, are completely different, right? Um, they start from a relatively high level, where right? you know the Qing keeps most of the main taxes after the Ming transition, um, experience like very moderate growth up to pretty much the, the 1680s, and then they stay there. Right? The 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 only expansion afterwards was the 1720s when Yongzheng implemented his uh, milk tree reforms, and that like that made a that gave a one-time addition of something like 15%. Um, to the total volume of the, of the state's extraction from agriculture. But other than that, right, um, from basically 1680, essentially to 1900, right, the agricultural tax remains locked in place. Um, and this is even true after 1850, when presumably, you know, like the this, this Qing state is in deep crisis, um, it's spending unprecedented sums on military campaigning, and later on attempts to industrialize and modernize the economy. <clears throat> and at the same time, <clears throat> it's dramatically escalating non-agricultural taxation. But the agricultural tax does not grow. It may actually very well have actually shrunk after 1850, from, from 1850 to, to 1900. Right? So the, 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 the difference between these two sections of the fiscal state could not be more, dra more dramatic. Right? One, um, seems to be, you know, like it, it's a flexible tool, right? The, the non-agricultural taxes are flexible. They, 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 they grow and sometimes fall a little bit in response to changes in fiscal demand and in response to the size of the economy. Agricultural taxes seem completely impervious um, to either the state's escalating demands, and this was all, even true before 1780 when the state was fighting quite a, bit of, um, quite a few wars in Xinjiang and Tibet. Um, but especially after 1850, like even after the state's finances just completely sink into crisis, the agricultural tax is not increased. And this is explicit, right? The you know, policymakers state, it's 
and many of his colleagues in, in the 1860s state with very clear conviction that we can raise non-agricultural taxes, especially we can raise commercial taxes because we think the merchants can actually bear it. We cannot raise agricultural taxes because we don't think the peasants can actually take it. All right, so uh, this is just like summarizing what I just said. The, the, the non-agricultural tax behaved kind of rationally in most in, in the basic form of, of its rationality and its ability to respond to changes in demand and changes in the economy. Um, it doesn't seem that different, right, from the behavior of other fiscal, of other like these, these, these early modern slash like modern fiscal states. Uh, if, if you compare it to the Russians in the late 19th century or the Japanese in the late 19th century, they're all making this shift towards non-agricultural taxation, right? Um, and in that sense, the Qing is not terribly different from these other states. Um, the Qing did not manage to raise non-agricultural taxes as much as the Russians or the Japanese, uh, but for the most part, that was because it was administratively constrained, but right? it, it faced a larger empire that was more complex. Um, and as, people, as we'll see in a few, a few slides, people have argued that this constrains the state's ability. Um, to really effectively ramp up taxation. Plus, uh, because the state was effectively broke after 1850, um, when it tried to collect these new commercial taxes, most notably they created this new commercial tax called the Lisian, um, which was pretty much like the, the backbone of Qing finance until it got out, got out of the, the type of rebellion. But right? like it had to construct that administrative apparatus, to collect these taxes under massive fiscal pressures when it essentially was bankrupt. Um, and because the agricultural taxes, which were the bulk of taxes at the time, were so low and not, not providing any usable surplus, um, the state was administratively constrained in what, it could, in what it could actually do on the ground. So compared to their relatively more affluent Russian or Japanese peers, um, the Qing state was not able to successfully, not able to tax non-agricultural sources uh, quite as aggressively, even though it still ramped it up. Um, quite a bit. But nonetheless, right, the, the basic point is the Qing's approach towards non-agricultural taxation is not fundamentally different than what you see in Russia or Japan or frankly in England in the 1700s or France or Germany. Or, like, it, it's pretty intuitive and rational, for lack of a better word. The agricultural tax is completely different, right? Like it was, it remained almost completely stagnant until the final years of the dynasty. Um, and you could say, well, maybe you don't need to raise agricultural taxes because you actually can raise non-agricultural taxes. Like, shouldn't the non-agricultural taxes suffice to meet demand? Well, clearly that's not the case, right? especially after 1850. The same state does regain for a, a, a few decades some semblance of what seems to be fiscal stability, but it does that um, by dramatically cutting its investment in its, its bureaucratic infrastructure, by weakening its, its ability to alleviate famines, um, basically it had to shrink its administrative functions um, because the, the, the growth in non-agricultural taxes was not quite enough to meet all its spending needs. Right? Um, the military needs, the kind of attempt to industrialize, um, the payment of foreign indemnities and so on and so forth, um, these exceeded you know, you know, had the Qing maintained its formal level of, of administrative capacity, that total bulk of spending would have well exceeded what non-agricultural taxes were able to su support, even after they had grown by quite a bit. Right, so instead, the, the Qing can only make ends meet by sub substantially shrinking um, its administrative ca uh, capacity and functionalities. And so even after that, they go into considerable debt. Like they take on quite a bit of foreign debt. Um, something to the tune of like two or three million taels a year. Um, and like by like 1895, they have something like 50 million taels of foreign debt accumulated. It's quite a lot, right? So, so clearly the state had to go into debt and had to cut spending by a lot just to make ends basically meet because non-agricultural taxes, even after their increase, uh, were not enough to fully meet demand. They had to basically self-mutilate their functionality, uh, the state's functionality. So there still was a lot of demand to raise agricultural taxes, and especially in the context of industrialization, um, not raising agricultural taxes prevented the state 
in a pretty direct fashion from investing more in industry, right? The Qing does try during the Yangwu years to, uh, through this kind of Guandu Shangban mode, to, inv to invest in, in, in industry. But no, no, the fact that they have to rely on Guandu Shangban, which is state supervision um, and commercial execution, tells you the state didn't have that much capital of its own to actually invest. Now, this could have, may not have been a problem, but for the fact that the merchants themselves, right, like these commercial private entities, didn't have that much capital themselves either. <laughs> so all in all, the industrial efforts, um, the industrialization efforts in the late Qing were kind of capital starved. And this could have been made quite a bit better, even with a relatively moderate increase to the, to the agricultural tax, but none was actually attempted for nearly the entire dynasty. All right, so I think this is at the point where I should basically kind of give you guys a slightly more detailed outline of what actually happens with Qing agricultural taxes, <coughs> right? <coughs> so from 1644 to like the 1680s and 90s, <coughs> um, right after the conquest, there's of course quite a bit of um, uncertainty over taxation, there's fluctuation, um, you know, initially they don't control the entire country, then eventually after a number of years, they, could, they actually do control the entire country, but the economy is the economy is at this point. So there's some debate over how much you can tax agriculture. Eventually, um, around 1680, they finally settle around what the early Qing bureaucrats called the kind of precedent of the, of the Vali era, which means that they can tax as much as the late Ming Vali regime was able to, to tax. And this basically amounts to Nancy measurements to something around um, 30 million taels a year, uh, plus five, plus about four to five million um, of grain tributes um, every single year. But starting from 1680 onwards, right, the state, the, the, the total volume of agricultural taxation remains incredibly stable. So as we, discuss, as we just discussed, it stays pretty much locked in place until 1900, um, with only one moderate expansion during the Yongzheng years, that's the Hohao reforms, which even though it was not that large in size, it was a 15% increase in, in agricultural taxes, um, but nonetheless, that one expansion triggered such a massive political backlash uh, in the early Tianlong era that basically the, 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 the entire bureaucracy just kind of backtracked and resettled in, into a fundamentally conservative um, paradigm, where basically it was like, okay, we, we went through this experiment under, under the Yongzheng Emperor of expanding our fiscal capacity. We don't think it went that well. And we think we're playing with fire here, so we really have to stop. Now, usually at this point, the, 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 the argument that people come back with me at, um, um, come back at me with is, you know, like, you're only counting formal official legal taxes. Now, what, like, what, what, what happens if we start counting informal taxes? Because as everyone who studies this, this knows, um, the team bureaucracy at the local level co collects illegally um, a very large amount of informal taxes. Um, now, now, informal taxes, obviously, because there are no official numbers, except at very rare junctures, um, it's very hard to measure. Um, nonetheless, there are you know, a couple of data points that we can use uh, to give you kind of, kind of like a very rough estimate. Like in the Yongzheng era, before, you, the, before Yongzheng tried to expand um, the agricultural tax base, he was doing this in response partially to a, the, the massive proliferation on the ground of informal surcharges, offer, often coming in the form of these like meltage fees. Right. Um, and so there were some estimates um, based on like lo crude local surveying done by Yongzheng level bureaucrats. And they say, well, informal taxes, they might, they, they likely were undercounting their total size, but what they counted suggested that informal taxes were as high as like something like 70 to 80% of the formal tax quota. Right. So, so for every doll, for every tail that you were paying to the state and official taxes, you were paying another 0 0.7 tails or to 0 0.8 tails and informal surcharges. Now, assuming that's, that's kind of like an undercount, um, the likely level of informal tax collection was roughly perhaps around double. Um, it was probably around the same size as the formal tax quota. So the real tax burden imposed on the agriculture sector was about double um, the formal tax quota. Um, all the way at the end of the dynasty in 1907, um, the, before the Qing finally tentatively raises agricultural taxes towards the end of the dynasty, it does a major fiscal accounting. And it discovers the existence of a lot of informal taxes on the ground, 
um, both at the local level and sometimes informally authorized by provinces when, without central level approval, approval. Right. So, so in those in the 1907 survey, they they come to an estimate of of informal taxation. Uh, that pretty much again amounts to roughly 100 percent, slightly more than that, of formal taxes. Right, and then in the middle we have some like on the ground informal estimates that people cite a lot, um, from Jiangsu and Zhejiang in the 1810s and 1820s, and there again, right, you see informal taxes being relatively assessed at about 100 percent of formal tax gold. And this is not just the agricultural tax, right? So, so we know that there was, there was lots of corruption in non-agricultural taxes as well. And our best estimates suggest that the total volume of informal tax collection in the non-agricultural sector, in the commercial sector, um, was also something like about 100% of the formal tax quota, sometimes a, a little bit above that, sometimes a little bit below that. So looking just at agricultural taxes, it seems at least plausible that even if you count the informal taxes, um, the total volume of, of state extraction from agriculture, like for, from uh, directly from agriculture, likely did not expand by very much, if at all, from something like the early 1700s all the way to 1900. And at the very least, the formal tax, or like the legally authorized tax, quota, did not expand whatsoever. Um, over this period, the economy and the population both more or less triple. Right? The economy grows slightly slower than the, than the population with some moderate decline in per capita income, but the decline was relatively small. And for the most part, living standards kept up um, with demographic expansion. Um, even after 1800, the state, when the state was because of the Taiping and other rebellions, plus you know, foreign, like foreign war, wars with foreign powers and war indemnities and so on and so forth, uh, state is plunged into nonstop fiscal crisis. It chooses to increase taxes really aggressively on commerce and industrial production and salt and so on and so forth, but not on agriculture. And this is, as we discussed before, a pretty destructive, a destructive choice um, for this, the, the, the country's economic development, its industrialization process, and eventually for the state's own administrative capacities as well. It, it gets so weak that it can't relieve famines, it can't control its local governments, it just loses control of the country and that eventually kills it. So most of the explanations um, currently circulating um, in the literature about the, this, this, uh, this, the, the Qing state's really weak finances, like everyone recognized the Qing state was really fiscal weak. And there have been many attempts to actually explain this. Um, there are three major kinds of explanations, all because, you know, like economic history and institutional these, the history these days it has pretty much fallen under the influence of economics, right? So uh, most of the, the major pre existing, most of the, the explanations that have gotten lots of intellectual play uh, in the past half century or so are pretty much all kind of like rationalist economic. Um, and these come in three varieties, right? So first, some people would argue that since they don't really need to raise agricultural taxes, Second, people would argue that even if it had the need to do so, it didn't really have the, the administrative capacity to do that. Or third, you know, more recently, some people will argue that it lacked the will to do so. And this comes in two flavors, right? You know, this comes in ideological flavors, as we'll discuss later on. It also comes in the kind of like self-interested political flavors. And this basically means that the Qing they didn't raise taxes because political elites themselves, because policymakers themselves um, didn't want to pay taxes. So their self-interest was not aligned um, with the interest of the state as a whole. And their selfishness prevented the state from actually raising taxes. Right, so three different kinds of rational explanations, demand side, supply side, and I guess what you could best, you could best call kind of like a, a political will problem that stems from collective action problems and incentive misalignment. <clears throat> now, all of these things, like, I don't think any of these are wrong, um, but they're also, not, they're also not, not complete and they don't have in many, they don't really have the capacity um, to explain these, the stagnation of the agricultural tax. But let's go through them one by one. First category, first category is, is the most popular one, right? Um, there's a very large literature that argues that the Chinese state fought fewer wars um, and therefore was under less fiscal pressure than its European peers, where China is more easily unified. Uh, therefore it's like more peaceful and they're peaceful countries don't need as much tax income as countries that are fighting wars all the time. 
right? So you see this in Ben Wong, you see this in Philip Hoffman and Walter Scheidel, like many people have made variations of this argument. Couple of problems, right? It clearly doesn't apply after 1840 anymore. Right? Like after the Opium War, the Sing State begins fighting lots and lots of wars, very often against fully modernized Western militaries. And the Taiping, of course, was like the biggest fiscal crisis in Sing history. Before 1780, it's also kind of like a dubious proposition, right? Because, you know, as the, as the, the new Sing history points out, the Sing State is fighting lots of wars. Um, and Xinjiang and Tibet, and it spends a lot of money on those things, right? So it's not clear at all that the total state investment in warfare is necessarily less than, say, like an average European state before 1780. So really, you're looking at like a 60-year window between 1780 and 1840. And even during then, there was like the White Lotus Rebellion and so on and so forth. Um, so it's a little bit questionable, right? And second, it also doesn't explain the, the Sino-Japanese comparison when like Japan doesn't fight many wars. Um, until the, the, the um, Tokugawa Meiji transition, right? So, so Japan is a relatively peaceful country. It, nonetheless, it, it taxes really aggressively. Um, so the, the model is powerful enough in that like undoubtedly, especially for this like 1870 to 1840 period, and perhaps even before that, because I guess you could argue in some, in some more convoluted, difficult fashion that the wars the Qing fought were not the same kind of wars that the European dynasties were fighting, so it needed less, less fiscal spending and so on and so forth. And maybe that's partially true before 1780. So the, 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 the demand side incentives were quite clearly there looking in the background, um, but they run into difficulties after 1840 and especially after 1850, plus specifically in the, in the realm of horizontal comparisons, it doesn't also explain the sino Japanese comparison, plus in, if you're looking at vertical comparisons, the Ming is pretty peaceful too. Right? The Sung is not, of course, but, but the Ming is pretty peaceful. The Tang is rel relatively peaceful before and after the Anglo-China Rebellion. Um, not all of them tax more aggressively um, than the Qing. So, and arguably in some ways the Qing fought more wars than the Tang did or the Ming did and so on and so forth. It attacks more lightly. So there are blind spots to this demand side. Oops, let me just go back one slide. All right, the second category basically says the Qing, okay, maybe it's sometimes it has strong demands to raise taxes, um, but it, it lacked administrative capacity to do so. Now, this argument applies quite well um, to non-agricultural taxes after 1850, when the Qing state really had a lot of demand for raising taxes, and so it really made a really concerted effort to boost non-agricultural taxes after 1840, but nonetheless, um, quite clearly, you could point to major administrative constraints um, that were preventing the state from raising those non-agricultural taxes more aggressively than it actually did, even though arguably it, very, it, it almost certainly wanted to do so as a fiscal matter. Um, nonetheless, when it comes to agricultural taxes, even this runs into some difficulties, right? So this argument comes in simple and complex forms. Um, the simple form is popular in kind of like this really old 1970s, 1980s mainland Chinese histori historiography, like more recent, more sophisticated um, fiscal scholars like you know Chen Feng, Ni Yuping, uh, he, uh, he Ping, uh, Xu Yi, and so on and so forth. Like they're more wary of this simple form of of the supply side argument, and they're 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 much more careful. But in the like in a, in an older generation of Chinese mainland his, historians, very often the argument basically was that the Qing couldn't raise taxes more than it did. You know, if it actually had done so, peasants would have rebelled, um, there would have been total chaos and social collapse in the countryside and so on and so forth. And to some extent, you know, they draw this from lots of claims to this effect made by Qing bureaucrats themselves. But as you argue, like I will argue later on, those perceptions of Qing bureaucrats were made under very heavy ideological influences. And they actually were not practically true, which I will argue to you in very, short, um, very shortly. The more complex form, um, which come, has, has emerged in the past like five, 10 years, perhaps in recognition that, that, that the simple form doesn't really work very well. And this is associated with you know, Janet Rubin, Milo Bean, um, Singh and Mort Gucci, and so on and so forth. This basically argues that the size of the Qing Empire created massive principal agent problems that made the state hesitant to, hesitant to raise taxes. 
And this is almost certainly true to some extent, right? So the, the argument basically kind of goes that if you're a central planner and you want to raise taxes, what you have to be careful about is that you know that your local agents, once like the minute that you look away, will try to kind of use formal taxes as, as an excuse to engage in corruption. Like they're gonna charge informal surcharges to the local population to make themselves wealthy. And so basically that means that you know, for every dollar that you charge in formal taxes, like you're gonna be charging like a buck 25 on the ground at the very least, if you're not careful, right? And the larger your country is, the harder it is to actually monitor um, your local agents, which basically, which then means that the larger the country is, the more likely it is that local agents will be able to get away with collecting informal taxes. <laughs> so, the larger the country, the more populous its population, the more complex the economy, um, the greater the principal agent problems we could be between the center and its local agents. And what this means is, you know, like if your target extraction rate from the, the, the rural economy is 5% or 6%, you think that you can get away with collecting 5 to 6% of total production away from the local population then that means that if the real tax rate is gonna be five to 6%, then you can only, the, for, the formal legal tax rate can only be something like three to 4% because you have to take into account the addition of informal surcharges onto the formal tax quota. So if you don't wanna risk over, over taxing the population, um, you can't go beyond three to 4%. So therefore, when, like, what that means is when your population grows, when the economy becomes more complex, and assuming you want to hold the tax rate, the real tax rate steady, then the nominal official tax rate has to go down um, to avoid overtaxation. Right, it's a very clever argument and quite powerful in many kinds of ways. Um, as I just argued, it applies very nicely to non-agricultural taxation. Um, when it comes to agricultural taxation, however, neither of these really function that well. And so how do we know that agricultural tax hikes were feasible in the late Qing? Well, after 1907, right, the, 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 the government finally thinks, okay, like I'm basically broke at this point. I have to raise taxes or I'm gonna die. It turns out it's already too late and they, they die a couple of years later afterwards. But, um, they finally experiment after 1907 with like very moderate agricultural tax hikes, which everyone is, is, is expecting to turn into social disaster. It turns out the peasants don't really care because the tax rate is so low at this point that you know, like raising it by 50% really isn't much of a big, big, big burden for most parts of the country. There are small moderate tax reforms like the one in Laoyang Shandong in 1908 and 1909, but they were easily dealt with and put down with you know, very minimal government investment. And for the most part, the country just took the agricultural tax hikes in 1907 in stride, which basically told successors to the Qing government, like these Republican governments that came after the Qing, who by nearly every measure that we have were, were at least for the first couple of decades of their existence, administratively weaker than the Qing was in say like 1870. Those governments saw that the Qing was able to raise agricultural taxes without setting off rebellions. And they realized, oh, okay, okay, now we have to, like, we realize we can actually raise these taxes and get away with it. So they raised these, raised agricultural taxes really aggressively. Um, and by like, by like 1930, uh, agricultural taxes are basically triple what they were in the late Qing. And guess what, the peasant population Certainly, doesn't didn't likely wasn't very happy with this, but it didn't rebel, and it was able to accept all of this, right? So there's very and plus, you now the Qing's experiment in 1907 itself was on its own terms pretty much a success. Where it, it, the state got new income, um, there wasn't too much, there, there wasn't any unmanageable local opposition, and in the end, um, things were okay. Now it's very hard to imagine if something was feasible in 1907 where, when basically the Qing state's administrative infrastructure had already completely collapsed, um, that you couldn't do the same thing. In like 1870, 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1870, 1880, before that 1840, 1830, or any, any time during the Qing era. 
that clearly in these earlier, that, um, earlier times, the state's administrative capacity was better than what it was in 1907. And so if you could implement an agricultural tax hike in 1907, well, you can implement it probably in like 1870 and so on and so forth. Right. In 1907, the hike comes too late to save the state's administrative capacity and the state crumbles anyway later on, a few years later. Um, but you know, had those tax hikes come earlier in like 1870, perhaps the state could have been saved or at least like, it, it could have extended its, life, its, its lifetime by a few more decades. Who knows? Okay, so two minutes remaining. Okay. Oh, really? Only two, oh, okay. Sorry. I, I, I haven't even gone to the, um, the ideological part. All right, so, so the latter is, um, it doesn't, basically the, the, the main problem which we, I, I guess we can discuss in the Q&A is it doesn't really summarize. Um, the, uh, the, 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 it, it doesn't really predict an absolutely stagnant total volume of taxation. It, it, it predicts a declining tax rate um, that goes down with population expansion, but doesn't predict an absolutely stagnant absolute volume of taxation, which is actually what you see in agricultural taxes. Plus, um, for reasons that we can discuss later, the model itself has certain kinds of limitations once it's, once it's actually applied um, to the agrarian setting. It actually applies better to like the, the township urban setting, but less well to the, to the agricultural setting. Um, so political elites, I'm just gonna say that basically the problem with this is seeing political elites had more self-interest and you know, if you're thinking about like their own financial self-interest, well, most of them were invested more heavily in commerce than they were in agriculture or land, right? So if, you're, if you think the self-interest of political elites was what was preventing the tax hikes, then presumably that would, have been, that would have been like a stronger force for commercial taxes than for agricultural taxes. But instead, the thing raises commercial taxes really aggressively, but doesn't do anything for agricultural taxes. So basically the point is the Qing had huge incentives to raise agricultural taxes. It, also, it almost, all, almost certainly also had the ability to do so. So in that case, what's left, right? Now, okay, if you're, now we think, okay, like we've kind of exhausted the main rationalist explanations. And if they don't work that well, what's left? Well, maybe we, got, we ought to think about some kind of like soft factors. What about ideology? Well, like what about the ideological mentality, the, the worldviews um, of the elite? And in a somewhat earlier generation of scholars, you know, Maggie Zeldin, Bill Rose, Susan Mann, and they speak of these, these ideological factors in some detail. And the way they do this, however, um, is that they, they speak of like a general Confucian bias against, uh, against taxing farmers and peasants, against yan li, against like speaking of profit, against yu nin zhang li, you know, competing with profit, uh, competing with the people for profit. Now, that, Rhetoric, if you read enough Qing memorials, and I've read, like, I've read thousands of them th throughout writing this project, certainly kind of was lurking in the background. People talk about these biases, although sometimes disapprovingly. But yes, but there was, everyone acknowledged, you know, a, a good Confucian. We should be a little bit wary of speaking of profit. And certainly you should be wary of tax and farmers and farmers and peasants. But however, this is the problem, right? The Qing was a much lower tax state than any other previous Chinese dynasty. The Ming was like five percent of GDP by according to like crude, really crude estimates. The Qing was like one to two percent. The Sung was ten percent, perhaps. The Tang was like five to seven percent, and so on and so forth. Right? The Sung and the Ming were not any less Confucian than the Qing. Right? Like obviously, very arguably, they were perhaps more Confucian, like more rigorously orthodox Confucian than their in their political worldviews. It didn't stop any of them from raising taxes. So the question is, what changed in the Qing? Um, it, it, you know, one tempting possibility is, well, the Qing is Manchu, right? The, the, the Qing is ruled by Manchus and so on and so forth. Whereas the previous two dynasties that I talked about, the Song and the, and the Ming are you know, like Chinese dynasties. So perhaps the introduction of Manchu rule made through the Qing into like a more fiscally conservative paradigm. Well, there's, there's difficulty with this is that if you read the sources, right? Like if you read the sources, and I've read, again, like something like 2,000 palace memorials, a lot of private, private writings, like the Manchu-ness of the scene does not get cited as a reason for keeping taxes low. You can imagine something like, because you're Manchu and you're ruling over a hostile population, you gotta tax more lightly and be more careful. 
beyond like the first two years of the dynasty, this was not stated as, as a reason um, to, low, to keep taxes low. And much more importantly, right? So the team becomes steadily more fiscally conservative over time. Right, the first few dynasties, the, the first, few de first few decades after conquest, they were still willing to kind of like tinker with the, the fiscal regime. But it's really from 1680 onwards that conservatism really sinks in and locks in. But over time, right, the kind of like manchuness of the dynasty, the, 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 the salience of the imperial court's Manchu characteristics and the limitations that might, may or may not bring, um, begin to kind of like be, become a little bit more diluted over time. Right. So as the, as the salience of the Manchu factor in politics declines somewhat over time, the conservatism of the Qing fiscal state grows, grows dramatically at the same time. Right. So at least within the overall Qing context, it's very hard to draw any kind of correlation between these three factors in Qing politics. But more importantly, you just don't see it mentioned. Um, in, in sources, right? So now what are the sources that I use um, to construct my arguments? Now my argument basically is the previous ideological arguments about Confucianism, they, they have obvious limitations. They can't explain why the thing was unique, but they're onto something, right? Like they, they, they point to something about you know, like the ideological nature of fiscal behavior. But the challenge then is to explain why it's seen fiscal ideology this might be operating under the same Confucian background of like political thought as did Ming and Song in fiscal policy, why it was so much more conservative. So, but nonetheless, it's, it's a fully ideological argument, right? So what are my sources? Um, I, 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 me and my RAs in Beijing pulled about 2000 memorials. Um, some of these are from the Gongzhong down in Taipei. Um, that's online. Uh, you know, a couple hundred are from the um, First National Historical Archives in Beijing. Um, quite a few of them are in published collections and so on and so forth. Um, from the Ming, I got 150 or so from mainly the Huangming Tingshi Wenbian, um, but also some private writings and so on and so forth, just as a matter of contrast. We, I, look at, I, I looked at a lot of imperial decrees and then there are like a plethora of private, private writing collections um, that I collected for these kinds of things lower level ministry of documents. Nonetheless, right, this is an intellectual history and it doesn't rely really on quantification, pretty much not at all. Right? This is an intellectual history of ideas and how they were used in the political arena. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to summarize the main argument in pretty much like five to 10 minutes. Like Lee, bear with me for five, 10 minutes while I summarize the argument. And then I promise this will okay. be After a you're co organizer, so I will give yeah. you some leeway. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, so, so basically the argument is that the main difference between Ming and Qing fiscal ideology is that the Ming-Qing transition creates this massive paradigm shift in the way that fiscal conservatism um, was expressed. And also the Ming, because of the kind of explicit interpretation of the Ming-Qing transition, um, that kind of fiscal conservatism like, wins dramatically more support in the early Qing, then it was able to in the late Ming, in the later Ming. And that begins to put the Qing onto this like deeply fiscally conservative paradigm that sweeps across the vast majority of its political elites. Now, so this is the part where we have, we have to talk a little bit about basically what, what I mean by, by ideology. ideology. Ideologies have two components, right? They're, usually they have a normative comp component which tells you what to do. Right, so in Confucian fiscal thought, this would be the part where, Confucian, where Confucianism, where you know, Confucius himself tells you that, fisc, uh, that you know, fiscal extraction is kind of like a necessary evil, it should be wielded really carefully, um, the gentleman should be kind of ashamed of pursuing profit and so on and so forth. Right? That's the normative goals. Then there's the empirical part of the ideology, which tells you if you violate those normative goals, what's gonna happen to you? Right, so, so in some ways, like, you know, if you think about the religious analogy to, to Christianity, right, like, so the normative part of Christianity is, say, like, believe in God, like, be a, be a good person, believe in God. The pragmatic dimension is, if you don't believe in God, you're going to go to hell. Um, now, that may not seem very pragmatic, but it, it is a consequentialist threat, basically, right, and that's what the point here. So in the Qing context, right, the normative part basically is, okay, there's this like normative dubiousness um, to taxation, but the pragmatic part basically tells you, right, the, the claim of the Qing was if you 
raise agricultural taxes on peasants beyond, beyond kind of like the late Van Li era red line. Well, look at what happened to the Ming, right? Peasant rebellions killed them. And that's what's gonna to happen to you too, if you cross that red line, right? So that's the empirical message, right? And the argument basically is that in the Ming, there was no such empirical message, right? People were grappling for what would actually happen if you raised taxes. And you couldn't really say because uh, both the Ming state and its so so and town predecessors, they all raised taxes. And for the most part, they were fine afterwards, right? Like eventually they die, but usually it's like very often like hundreds, hundreds of years, a hundred years afterwards. And it, drawing a line from the tax hikes to the eventual collapse is quite difficult empirically and historically. So in the Ming, right, like in the late Ming, most of the, like nearly all of the political weight is placed on the normative part. Like if you're a fiscal conservative arguing that you can't raise taxes in the, in the late Ming, you're doing so from a principled moral position because actually you don't have a very clear, obvious argument available to you of what the empirical pragmatic consequences of tax hikes actually are, right? So in that kind of context, where political actors do sometimes respond to normative exhortions, right? But the, the, the claim is, and this will surprise no one who thinks, who knows anything about, about politicians and how, and how they operate, they respond to normative messages very inconsistently, and they do so weakly, for lack of a better word. The, 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 the political force of an ideology becomes much, much stronger when you can match the normative messaging with a deep pragmatic, a deep and powerful, salient, visible pragmatic consequence that you can point to to tell people like what are the consequences of not following the normative goals, right? So it's only when the normative part of an ideology meshes and dovetails with a really strong empirical message that the ideology becomes really politically powerful and in many cases restrictive. And that's what happened during the mainstream transition. Right? It's really about basically the way that the Qing elite interpreted Ming, um, Ming collapse. Now, how did, now just to illustrate this, right? So, so you know, like the, as we just said, like if you look at you know, like memorials in the Huangming Jinshu Wenjian and Jinshu Wenmin and other other sources, the way that conservatives pressed against fiscal reform um, during the Van Li era or earlier was basically, you know, it's normatively bad, but we're not quite sure how bad. We think it might incite rebellion, but we don't really have a, a great example of that. Um, you know, the, the, the previous major peasant rebellions, you know, Huang Chao or, or um, the, the, the yellow, yellow turbans, those were all centuries ago, if not like nearly a millennium ago, if not more than like a thousand years ago. So those are distant and we don't really have a good empirical message. So, but because it's normatively bad, we shouldn't do it, right? So as you can see, right, that, that kind of argument relies predominantly on the normative force of the argument and therefore it's limited in how persuasive it actually is. Immediately after the Ming transition, right, like the, the tone of early Qing writing changes completely. It's kind of like this aha moment, right? Like we all thought that there was something anxiety inducing about tax hikes. We thought there was something wrong with it. Well, now we, we see the consequences. Like the Ming raised taxes after 1580. And that killed it, right? Because they raised taxes, the peasants couldn't take it anymore, and the peasants re rebelled, and the peasants killed the dynasty. And the Ming is really the only dynasty that is killed off by something that is explicitly, clearly a peasant rebellion, right? You could say the Yuan, the Mongol, the, 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 the Mongols were as well, but the, you know, if you read the early, earlier chunks of the, of the Ming Shu, the way they characterize, the kind of like late UN peasant rebellions were basically that they were kind of like general ethnically driven nativist rebellions against the against an abusive Mo like foreign ruler, right? So there was a there was kind of like a semi-nationalist, semi-ethnic, kind of like an ethnic undertone there that diluted the 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 emphasis on like overtaxation or peasantry and so on and so forth. The Ming collapse, everything is firmly focused on the peasant rebellions on why Li Zicheng was able to kind of like rally so many people to his cause in Northwest China, and why he was able to sack Beijing and kill the, and force the emperor to commit suicide, right? So after this, like, the, like you cannot overstate how traumatic this was to 
Confucian literati, right? The, this is, in their minds, like this unprecedented, historically unprecedented failure of the state. And the way they read it was the failure of the state stemmed most fundamentally um, from tax hikes. And so therefore, the, le the message for the Qing, what the paradigm shift this creates in the early Qing, is if you don't want to die in a similarly painful manner, avoid those tax hikes. Now, of course, this is kind of interesting, right? So because from our point of view, why did the Ming really collapse? Well, there are two schools of thought, right? You know, there are plenty of scholars, especially some in China, who, are, who would agree, like, you know, tax hikes played a major role in facilitating the Ming collapse. But at the same time, there are also many who would, in China and in other places, uh, perhaps most notoriously Ray Huang back in 1986, who, push, who, who really strongly pushed against this, this argument. And the argument is that the Ming collapse, not because taxes were too low, but actually because they were, um, not because taxes were too high, but actually because they were too low, right? And that argument goes, you know, the Little Ice Age in the early 17th century leads to famine. The state, because it didn't have enough money, um, wasn't able to offer very good famine relief. And the peasants rebelled because of the lack of famine relief, not because of really high taxes. And the, the evidence they sometimes use, and you know, Huang is notorious and much, much lambasted in, in the literature, but you know, there are plenty of people after him who had made, made the same argument uh, more recently and with better data. And so, so essentially, the, you know, the, 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 his, the historical world nowadays is split between these two camps. And as far as I can tell, it's not very clear which side actually has the upper hand. So you, if you would imagine like, you know, what would a set of impartial observers while Ming collapse have concluded about the causes of Ming collapse? You would have likely imagined that they would have, they would have also been kind of like torn, that there, there would have been arguments on both sides and it wouldn't have really been very easily settled. Instead, right, this is where you, you begin to see the ideological content of the Qing interpretations of Ming collapse within like five years of the collapse. If you read these like early Qing inter interpretations, the Gu Yan, Wu Huang Zongzi, Wang Fuzhi, the the, the, the Yan Yi Xue Pai guys, like massive amounts of, of memorials filed in court, everyone agrees the Ming collapsed because 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 it raised taxes, right? So the speed, the uniformity, the lack of consideration of plausible alternative interpretations shows you that there was something that was there was something beyond just like objective, rational, intellectual judgment going on here. There was like, a, this was like an intellectual movement. This was like an like intellectual slash ideological backlash against the trauma of Ming collapse, right? So the question is how did that, this coalition emerge so quickly? And this is the part where I basically argue that it's really about cognitive biases at work here, right? Now, even fiscal reformers in the Ming, even though they pushed through fiscal reforms to expand the state, they too knew that in the, in the Confucian canon, there was a frowning upon tax hikes, especially the agricultural tax hikes. So even when they raised taxes, there was a bit of anxiety. You know, if you read, say, Zhang Zhujong's memorials in private writing, he, he shows this quite a bit. He, he basically says, I have, to, it's not like, I have to engage in certain kinds of fiscal expansion because the state needs it. Um, but I'm, I'm worried about what's gonna happen. Like I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm kind of like on tender hooks. Um, I, I recognize that there's a kind of like a normative dubiousness about my actions. And so like even these, these fiscal reformers are kind of like cognitively trained to worry about the consequences of tax hikes. And then when something bad happens, you know, as a massive amount of cognitive theory shows, right? Like when you have a certain kind of normative inclination and an empirical event happens that even semi-plausibly lends itself to a empirical interpretation that strengthens your normative biases, you're going to jump to that empirical interpretation, right? So it's no surprise at all that like after, you know, Ming peasant rebellions become a really massive thing in the, the final couple of years of the dynasty and in the early Qing, because of the existence of this early Confucian normative bias, that you know, there's something normatively dubious and questionable about, about, about raising taxes. Once something goes really wrong, nearly everyone just says, okay, finally we have seen a concrete example of what exactly can go wrong if you raise taxes and look at how traumatically and catastrophically things actually went wrong. Right? So essentially it's kind of like a cognitive bias, cognitive, cognitive reinforcement process that is would be extremely familiar to any kind of cognitive theorist 
Like you have a set of normative premonitions, empirical event comes along and you immediately use that empirical event to kind of like reinforce your cognitive biases. And then once the two sides, once the empirical side, once the normative side come together, right, that's when the, the ideology goes from a political force, but not an overwhelming political force, as it was in the later Ming, when in fact the state was raising taxes against all these conservative voices, to an overwhelming consensus that you have to keep taxes down in the team. Now, the final point that I'm, I'm going to discuss is you know, the team taxes stayed down for basically more than 200 years, but right? that's an incredibly long period of time for an ideology um, to have effect on politics, right? Usually, by the mid to late, like late, late, later Qing, clearly, the, you know, from our point of view, right, the state was capable of taxing more because the agrarian economy had basically tripled from what it was in the early Qing. So, and tax rate, the tax rates had fallen to like less than a third of what they were um, in 1680, right? So if that's the case, then surely you have some room to raise taxes. Now, why was that kind of like, why was the growth of the real world economy, like why did that never tell the Qing bureaucrats that their assumption that they would kill off the dynasty if they raised agricultural taxes was wrong, was no longer actually true given the state of the economy, right? Like why did robust economic recovery and growth overturn the empirical presumption against and that was like this, this is perhaps actually the most interesting part of the start. Qing fiscal conservatism becomes institutionally self-perpetuating and self-reinforcing in some very interesting institutional ways. So most importantly, um, the Qing is the only state in the only dynasty in pretty much Chinese history to, to not conduct a major nationwide land survey. Right? The Ming does this during the Zhangzi Zhang reforms and does large pieces of it before that. The Song does land surveys quite often. The Tang does it during the Liang Shui reforms and so on and so forth. Right? Every other major dynasty does at least one, usually two or three major nationwide land surveys and keeps kind of like a regular pipeline of pro provincial level land surveys coming in so that it actually knows the size of its economy. The Qing does not do any land survey until like the final few years of the dynasty when the land surveys provided the empirical basis for trying to raise taxes after 1907. Without land surveys, what that means is there is no officially verified data on the size of the economy. And this matters hugely for politics because politics, like there's, there's no magical world in which like the actual expansion of the economy automatically gets translated into usable information um, in the political arena. Instead, the way that information works in politics, and this is no less true of modern states like your current American federal government or the Chinese government right now, there's a process of data collection and verification before information is actually usable as a political force in high level debates in policy making. And because the Qing cut off that information channel, like the, the official governmental estimate of how large um, the economy was, basically stayed unchanged from something like, like, eight, like you know, when was the last serious attempted land survey? Something that was like around like, like 1860. After 1860, the assumption of the size, like the state's formal assumption of the size of the economy stays, stays unchanged. Now, there are some local bureaucrats from time to time who recognize that actually like I don't, this doesn't seem to mesh with my local experience and so on and so forth. And they think, okay, maybe we have to do a, bit, do a better survey to see if the economy actually is still this small. But the, the thing is, the, the government doesn't let them, right? The government formally outlaws provincial level, like non-centrally authorized land survey from 1740 onwards. And before that, the, the, it, 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 it had effectively banned land surveying since like you know, 1680. So because of that, like, if you do your land, own land surveys, you're often risking your own neck. You might get demoted, um, you might get censored, um, censured. Like people don't dare do their own, own land surveys, but the state really is, is insistent that we can't do land surveys. But the question is, why can't you do land, land surveys? Well, the rationale is you can't do land surveys for the exact same reason that we can't raise agricultural taxes, right? The peasants know that the only purpose of a land survey is to raise taxes. 
So if you do tax, if you do a land survey, you're gonna you know, disturb the people, you're gonna draw me in. And what that means, and there's like hundreds of, of more was making this point over the course of the team. If you do a land, if you do a land survey, that's, that's as good as, as announcing to the population that a, an agricultural tax hike is coming in four or five years. And if you think that they're going to, like they can't sustain an agricultural ta tax hike, then you know, t telling them that you're going to do it in two or three years or four or five years, well, they're going to rebel right off the bat. So like, like, the, like, like doing the land survey is as good as announcing in terms of signaling an actual tax hike. So if you can't do the tax hike, you can't do a land survey either. And so because it's so deadly, af deadly afraid of peasants reacting against the agricultural tax hikes negatively through, through like mass desertion, um, abandoning their land, becoming bandits, and so on and so forth. They never even try to do a land survey. But without the land survey, it becomes politically imp impossible to overturn the assumption that this, the economy was not growing very much, if at all. At the same time, because the Qing stops taxing population um, after the Yongzheng eras, they do keep up the census, right? So because so the, the idea is that there's there's no downside to, to kind of like, Counting the population because the population will report its 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 its, uh, its demographic growth um, because doing so does not threaten the likelihood of like higher taxes. So the Qing sees the, this massive growth in the population, and it's it's commentated on endlessly, especially during the Qianlong era and the Zaxing era. But we see in official figures, this massive explosion of population. But at the same time, we think the economy is completely stagnant. What does that tell us? That tells us that we're in a very deep Malthusian crisis. Um, the phrase for this is uh, uh, right? So like the population is growing at unprecedented speed and nonetheless the total land in the country and therefore the, the total mouths it can actually feed has not grown, which means that we're, we're staring down the barrel of a serious exploding Malthusian crisis. And that means that we, we actually certainly can't afford to tax more heavily. If anything, we gotta tax, tax less heavily because the taxable surplus beyond basic subsistence for the population likely is shrinking because there's more miles to feed. So all of this comes together into this like big self-sustaining reinforcing cycle of, you, know, you, can't raise, you, you can't do land surveys because you fear present rebellions, you fear peasant rebellions because you know of the of kind of like the the the, the Ming Qing transition trauma, but if you don't do land surveys, you can't change the empirical presumptions of an overburdened peasantry. In fact, it actually makes it worse because you think you're in the Malthusian crisis, and so this just just goes on and on and on and on. Plus, in the in, in the nineteenth century, if you're in this mindset, every time there's a, there's a rebellion, the White Lotus, the Nian, the Taiping, it's interpreted immediately as a sign that you're actually overtaxing once again. So. In the end, the Qing state thinks, okay, we can't, we just can't tax. Now, finally, after 1900, it has to raise taxes because it's completely broke, right? Like it, it has these massive astronomical war and then accumulated to foreign powers. So finally, it, 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 expecting the, the worst, it raises taxes in 1907. It, it raises agricultural taxes very mild by like 30%, and then later by, by 40% in 1907. Um, Everyone's expecting the worst. Turns out, none, none, like nothing happened. Nothing, hmm. I'm having trouble here. Um, nothing seriously happened. Um, Qing collapse in 1911 had, no, had nothing to do with the tax hikes. It was mainly because it just lost control of, of, of its localities. But because in the end, the Qing turned out that it was able to raise taxes without triggering a you know, massive peasant rebellion. This emboldens successor regimes to raise taxes even further, even though they were actually administratively weaker than the Qing. Um, the rural population, for the most part, acquiesces, and the myth of, of the overburdened peasantry is shattered for a point. Um, so the Republic triples Qing tax levels. The early PRC in the 1950s triples Republican tax levels. You know, so by, by like the 1950s, peasants are paying pretty much like 10 times the taxes um, they were in the Qing. And guess what? The, you know, the, economically, it was completely sustainable. All right, advantages of the we All really right, so, need to wrap okay. up within one minute. So, 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 we don't have time for discussion. Right. Advantages, you know, it explains post-1840 developments, explains why agricultural taxes were treated differently from non-agricultural taxes, because the maintaining shock was really about agricultural taxes. Like no one ever presumed commercial interests were overburdened. 
um, it explains the vertical uniqueness of the Qing, why the Qing was different from the Ming and the Song, because they never had to go through this traumatic ideological paradigm shift. Um, final, final thing that I want to say is again, like the, the theoretical point that I want to draw away from this is that the, the, the point, the, the book as a matter of theory is fundamentally about how ideologies function, right? Ideologies are not really politically powerful when they're purely normative. They become politically powerful by, by marrying a normative message with a potentially self-reinforcing empirical prediction of consequences that then really kind of strikes the fear of God um, into political actors. And then, you know, as you saw in the informational context of you know, Qing land surveys, the sustaining of an, of an informational paradigm of an, inform of an ideological mindset has much to do um, with state attitudes towards information, uh, information collection and so on and so forth. So basically, it's, it, this is the kind of like a model of how ideologies um, become weaponized and activated and politically dominant, and then later on of how they are um, actually kind of institutionally sustained over long periods of time. All right, thank you. And I look forward to the questions. And sorry for taking so long. Okay, thank you very much, Taisu. Now, let me invite uh, probably first uh, Aziz to comment on Taisu's paper. Thanks, Aziz. Yeah, so um, first I'd just like to say thank you to, to, to Li Chen, to Tai Su, uh, to Marilyn, Serna, and to really all the organizers. And it's, uh, you know, it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to comment on just such a rich work um, that forces us, I think, to really reconsider the preconditions of the 20th century world order that we've come to know. So I had the opportunity to read the introduction for the book that Tai Su's um, so thoughtfully laid out. And I can't really wait to read the rest. I mean, I found the, the introduction to be gripping and a really rigorous presentation of Qing breakdown with clear resonances for the present. You know, how a seemingly objective economic science um, can produce massive destabilizing effects based on clear underlying conceptual weaknesses. And that should certainly be familiar from the last decade in our own global life, from the, the financial crisis that, um, that Taisu noted in that last kind of conclusion um, slide to more recent responses, for example, to, to COVID. Um, so I have three basic comments uh, for Taisu um, that really are just, uh, in a way, comment questions asking him to reflect on maybe um, broader themes connected to the, the arguments from this book. So they're all really about kind of the general theoretical and comparative historical implications of his argument. So the, the first is, you know, um, in a way a comment just about the resonances between this story and more recent stories. And I, you know, for me as a student of uh, American constitutional development, I could not help but think about the similarities between the story that he was telling and the way in which individuals are increasingly talking about contemporary American politics. So, you know, much has been made over the last few years uh, about really the idea of the American century coming to, a, to an end. And, um, you know, it's, it's striking to me the way in which Taisu's argument sort of suggests at maybe broader claims one could make about the circumstances under which one sees imperial decline and how de imperial decline might operate. So just at a level of generality, I mean, this felt like a story you could be telling about the US. So you have a massive polity that's facing kind of sustained and rolling social crises from both in internally and externally. It has a political class that's beholden to outmoded ideologies, including economic ideologies built on notions of non-interference uh, non in the economy. Uh, the political class is unwilling as a result to act boldly in the face of these rolling social crises. And even if it were to act boldly, there's profound institutional dysfunctions. In other words, that the institutions seem to be particularly uh, resistant to being able to address the kinds of social problems that that exists. This is sort of Taisu's note about the difficulty of implementing land surveys. We can talk about um, the, the structure of American um, the electoral processes and decision making as well. And so, you know, if we lay out this analogy, I guess the first thought is like, I'm curious what Taisu makes of it, the appropriateness of it as an analogy, but then also just more generally, what does it say about um, imperial decline? 
Um, are there kind of broader conclusions that we might be able to draw, even if they're not kind of causal rules, but or predictive rules um, about when we're likely to see decline take place slowly, when we're likely to see kind of cataclysmic shocks that disrupt and break down imperial orders? Um, what does this tell us about kind of the nature of how um, uh, powerful states uh, uh, collapse over time? So that's one kind of broad question uh, slash comment. The second is really more specifically about ideology and Taisu's use of ideology. And here, in a way, the, the question comment I have is I'd just like to hear a little bit more about how Taisu precisely is defining and thinking about the nature and types of ideologies. So ideology itself is an incredibly broad category. You know, so Taisu has a, a general definition in the introduction that focuses on the idea of belief systems that have kind of contestable worldviews. And then as he presented in the, in the talk, there's a way in which he kind of hones this down to emphasize the two dimensions of ideologies, the normative dimension and the kind of empirical pragmatic. But in a way, many different types of ideologies have both these normative as well as empirical pragmatic dimensions. And, you know, Taisu noted this in, in his comments. So religion, like re religion can be thought of as a kind of ideology that has normative and empirical pragmatic dimensions. Racial theories, like theories like white supremacy can have normative as well as, you know, pseudoscientific kind of empirical pragmatic dimensions. Um, theories of either socialist or capitalist democracy. So um, Marxist economics or kind of neoclassical economics can be thought of as um, uh, ideologies that have normative and empirical uh, pragmatic dimensions. <clears throat> and even law, you know, and legal orders can be conceived of as a combination of a multiplicity of ideologies that have both of these dimensions. So what exactly, what type of ideology are we talking about here? And, and here, you know, the argument really reminded me of um, work by um, Odette Lee now on the, the idea of a, a market principle yeah. or market givens that establish kind of economic rules about almost like objective economic rules about the likely effects of particular decisions. So here, you know, you can think of the Malthusian principles at stake as a kind of market principle where the thought is that, you know, agricultural production capacity is remaining flat, um, population is expanding, and that the disconnect between an expanding demographic population and flat um, agricultural production capacity means that the society is reaching the limits of its own self-sufficiency and that increasing uh, economic extraction in the form of agricultural taxes will necessarily end up undermining what remains of, um, of, of the economic um, sufficiency, self-sufficiency uh, in the rural base. So that, that feels like a kind of Malthusian market principle. And I'm curious if if Taisu would agree. Um, part of what's interesting about calling something a market principle is that at least in kind of Li Nao's analysis, that would mean that the market principle, as far as ideology goes, has real law-like qualities. So it's not publicly promulgated as we think of, you know, most traditional law, but in a way precisely because it's hidden, and not public, it has a capacity to, to reproduce itself and sustain itself over time without real kind of critical interrogation. But it has many of the other qualities you'd associate with, let's say, Lon Fuller's various um, criteria of law, that this seems to be a kind of market principle that's general, it's clear, it's prospective, it's consistent, it's something that can be satisfied, it's satisfiable, it's stable. We're talking about ideas that remained continuous for two centuries, and it's applied, you know, consistently as a way of thinking about political decision making. So Taisu emphasizes the idea that if you call something, if, excuse me, if an ideology is rational and scientific, it gives it a quality of greater durability. Um, you know, Lee now would say that if, if the ideology has enhanced law-like qualities, then it might be harder to disentrench. And in a way, I guess this means my question is, what does 
what, what do you see, Taisu, as the relationship here between law and ideology? In a sense, can an ideology be a type of law and vice versa? Or, you know, something that's law or law-like itself, a form of ideology? When are ideologies more generally stickier and when are they less sticky? And can we construct something like a typology that allows us to think of the different ways in which normative principles and empirical pragmatic um, ideals sort of join together to create stickier and less stickier versions of, of ideological politics. So this is, that's a second question really about kind of honing in more specifically on what kind of ideology we're discussing. And finally, you know, I have a third kind of broad question uh, slash comment, which is in a way about, I'm curious your thoughts on the political and ethical meaning of fiscal strength. There's a way in which, you know, this is a work of history, um, but there's a kind of presumptive experience when you're reading the introduction, even in a way in the conversation, that fiscal strength is coded as a positive, as a kind of political good. And, uh, you know, I'm just curious about, in a sense, your thoughts um, with respect to this. And let me kind of dig in a little further. First, I should say, that as far as my own kind of normative principles and general approach to political economy, I think of myself as a statist. I'm a strong um, believer in, a, in the social welfare state and principles of social democracy, and that requires an extractive state that can engage in practices of redistribution. But when I was reading the introduction and hearing the talk, I just couldn't help but think of what this debate looks like and the implications of fiscal weakness or fiscal strength from you know the perspective of the bottom up you know like from the perspective of the ordinary you know chinese person who has to live through the eruptive social changes that mark both the 19th century as a matter of political and personal experience and then really the the 20th century and and as you say the kind of overcorrection that you see in in the mid 20th century with respect to the kind of lessons from the, the Qing dynasty. And maybe I'll, uh, you know, I'll pursue this through a kind of analogy again with the US, which is in the US, there's a really common story about the move from the Articles of Confederation during the very early period of independence to the US federal constitution in the 1780s. And a large part of what motivates that move is that you have political elites, revolutionary era political elites that are deeply concerned about fiscal weakness. So they think that you need to have a more centralized and extractive um, administrative state, um, at, you know, this very early kind of historical moment as a way of being able to maintain order and control over the colonies, but also as a way of being able to ensure something like substantive rather than just formal independence from the European empires that, you know, if you want to have expansionist goals of um, territorial growth across the continent, or if you want the US to be something like an independent commercial power that can compete effectively with Europe, you need to have greater fiscal strength through centralization. And the worry was that the Articles of Confederation established a truly decentralized system that didn't, you know, that wasn't conducive to this. But at the same time, before and after the implementation of the US federal constitution, you actually do have rural rebellions by poor settlers um, in the form of the Shays Rebellion in the 1780s, the Whiskey Rebellion in the 1790s. And for many of these folks, they saw the activity of creating something like a strong fiscal state as undermining kind of localist democracy, economic independence, as bound to a kind of a destructive economic practice that had placed real profound burdens on those at the bottom rung of um, the emerging administrative order. Now, I'm, you know, this is not meant as a defensive of laissez-faire, but I'm much more interested in what this means as far as, um, you know, as far as how we think about state consolidation. Um, the American story is obviously not the same as the, the Chinese story, but I am curious what the rise of fiscal strength tells us about questions of individual autonomy and control vis-a-vis -vis consolidating states. You know, if I think of work by David Scott or David Graeber, they present a kind of general suspicion 
of the global history of state consolidation in Europe and elsewhere, where you have the rise of a modern state built around extractive taxes that, that impose profound violence, everyday violence on ordinary people. And that in a way, what that suggests is, you know, a worry that maybe the problem isn't, you know, Qing fiscal weakness, but the rise of a particular kind of modern state form um, that, you know, is incompatible with the specific kind of everyday experiences that had emerged on the ground. So I'm just curious about the political and ethical meaning of fiscal strength versus fiscal weakness. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much Aziz. Uh, let's invite uh, Yu Hua to comment before actually Tai Su uh, starts to respond to the comments, I suppose. Please. Hi everyone. Hi everyone, um, I'm Yu Hua Wang. I'm a political scientist in the government department at Harvard University. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the organizers uh, for inviting me. I have prepared some slides. I will be try to uh, uh, finish my comments in 10 minutes so we can have some time for discussion. Uh, I'm a big fan of Tai Tzu's work, so it's always fun to read Tai Tzu's writings. Um, this is again, you know, as Tai Tzu said, a very time honored topic, you know, since, uh, you, know, he, you know, he went back to Max Weber, but I think, you know, also, uh, Karl Marx, you know, talked about the Asian mode of production, and then he compared, you know, Asia, including China and, in, and Europe. So it's a really, really time-honored topic. And then this is a very new and provocative argument that Tai Su is putting forward, you know, looking at ideology. And then I find it really innovative and then really provocative. And just, you know, reading the piece, you know, made me think about a lot of questions. Uh, and then uh, I highly recommend everyone to read it. You know, when the book is out, you know, this is going to be a great book with great, really good writing. And also Tai Tzu is really careful in the analysis, you know, going through all the alternative alternative hypothesis and then talking about, you know, how, you know, the, the assumptions behind his own argument. So I really like the piece. I just want to, you know, raise several questions. Uh, uh, the Main argument that Tai Tzu is putting forward is the following. This is an oversimplified version of the argument, by the way. The idea that uh, the previous dynasty, the Ming dynasty, collapsed because of higher tax. And then the early Qing elites kind of updated using this information uh, and then uh, figured that if we raise taxes, we would have the same fate as the Ming elites. So therefore, there's a right line in terms of you know, how much tax we can raise. And then therefore, they decided not to raise taxes to avoid being overthrown by the peasants. And then this leads to stagnant taxation. Just to put this in a comparative perspective, you know, this is a, you know, some data that I got from uh, a recent PhD from NYU. He collected data on, this is the taxation as a share of GDP in China and also in England uh, in the past, you know, 1,000 years, and then it's clearly, you can see what Tai Su is talking about is clearly a puzzle here. That is, you know, China used to have very high taxation in terms of share of GDP. China used to tax about, you know, 70% of the GDP in the Song Dynasty. But then starting, I think, in the Ming Dynasty, you see the decline of taxation. Then gradually in the Ming Dynasty, sorry, in the Qing Dynasty, basically the Qing Dynasty tax next to nothing. And then on the other hand, you see a, a huge increase of taxation in England, you know, which a lot of people, a lot of political economists uh, would use to explain, for example, the uh, uh, industrial revolution, but also the emergence of modern nation state. Also, this is uh, using some of the data I collected. Uh, the, this upper panel shows you the policies different dynasties were making in terms of taxation. And then the way I call this is, so, so I look at the policy and I see whether it's increased taxation or, or decreased taxation or maintain the previous taxation. And then what is shown here is uh, basically previously, before the Song Dynasty, you see a lot of policies were, were strengthening the fiscal capacity of the state. And then starting in the Song, you start to see a lot of policies start to weaken the fiscal capacity. There's a slight uh, increase of policies uh, that aimed at increasing fiscal capacity in early Qing. This is, you know, what uh, Tai Tzu talk about. This is the Yongzheng Emperor's policies. You know, for example, the the maltage fee and also um, called Tan Ding Rumu, absorbing the labor service into the land taxes. But this is very temporary. Overall, you see a, a continuous decline since the Song Dynasty. And then this is also reflected in the data I collected on per capita taxation. This is uh, per capita taxation. You can see. Uh, Song was the peak, and then afterwards you see a continuous decline. 
But this also raises a question that I will pose later. That is, this is now the Qing phenomenon. So which means um, the low taxation phenomenon, both in terms of actual policies, but also in terms of the outcome of the policy, in terms of taxation, was very low starting in the Ming, at least. Uh, so I, you know, one question I will pose earlier is, why Qing is so unique? The first question I want to pose is, this is, you know, this is the dominant view in the social sciences about physical state or state building. That is what Charles Tilly called war made the state argument. And then there are certainly new versions of the balancist argument. For example, Dan Slater at the University of Michigan recently made the argument internal conflict also made state in South Asia. So the first question I want to pose to Tai Su is, um, you know, looking at, you know, this is the data I collected on the number of wars uh, in the last 2000 years in China. And then what is shown here is certainly in terms of external war, we certainly see you know, a decrease in the number of external wars since the Song Dynasty. Song Dynasty was the peak as a result of the so-called, you know, the medieval warm period. It was very warm in China. So therefore the nomads were attacking, you know, China for um, grabbing goods and, and people. But then since, you know, 13th century, 14th century, basically there were very few external wars. So I wonder whether a simple explanation is it just, you know, there was no war. Uh, there were, you know, some a little bit more war, for example, at the end of the Qing Dynasty, right? And then more internal conflict, this is the Nian and also the Taiping. But basically during the whole period of Qing, you see very small number of wars, both external and also, also internal, right? So I just wonder whether that can explain the low taxation in the Qing. The second question I want to pose is, what really led to the low taxation? This is uh, you know, a, a formula I got from a, uh, a classic book by Wang Yejian. This is a Taiwanese scholar who got his PhD from, from, uh, from the US in history. And then wrote, you know, I still think this is probably the best book on Qing taxation. Uh, it was published in 1973. Uh, the formula for the Qing emperors to use uh, to tax people in the Qing dynasty was the following. That is, there's a land quota. This is the the whole national taxation, the whole amount of taxation. And then they, they froze the quota at the beginning of the Qing. And then this quota is a function of registered land area, which is you know, the, you know, how, how large the land is uh, registered in the government uh, times the tax rate. You know, this is you know, how, you know, per, per, per move of land or per acre of land, you know, how much we should extract. And then the question for me is which which of these two led to the stagnant taxation, right? And for, for Tai Su's theory, it seemed to be the latter part, the tax rate, because uh, for, for per move, oh, you're, you're not saying, it's for both probably. But then my question is, for the first part, you know, what happened to the first part? This is, you know, again, from Wang Yejian's book, this is the uh, registered land area uh, in Ming and Qing. And what this graph shows is, for most part of Qing, they didn't actually recover back to the Ming era. So, you know, this is the, the Ming data, this is, you know, during Zhang Zhizheng's reform. And then this is based on the cadastral survey that Zhang Zhizheng did in the late 16th century. It only in the end of Qing, this is early 20th century, that Qing was able to go back and overpass the, the Ming era. But for most period under the Qing, they were under the Ming quota. But then the puzzle for me is, if you look at the map, this is, this is the Ming territory, you know, the, within the right borders. This is the Ming territory. This is the Qing territory. The question for me is, with almost twice of the territory of Ming, uh, why, did, why didn't Qing tax those areas? So the, you know, Tai Su's theory is in those areas, in the, in, the, in the inland China, the peasants would fear land survey because they, when they sense later land survey, they would rebel because they, they, they think there might be a tax increase. But my question is, in the newly gained area, why didn't Qing tax those people? You know, just, you can just, you know, go to survey those areas and then start to impose a tax because those places are newly gained. They probably don't compare, for example, the previous tax and then the, the new tax. I understand the theory applied here, but for those areas, I, you know, now in Xinjiang, for example, I understand in the frontiers, there's, you know, very few people, but, you know, in Sichuan, for example, in, 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 in Hebei, in, in Beijing, current Beijing, in the, in the Manchuria area, it's very populated. So why didn't the Qing tax those areas. And then that's a very simple way to raise taxation. You don't have to raise the tax rate in those areas to do this. Third question, uh, why was Qing so unique, right? So Tai Tsung make the case that Qing was uh, very unique in Chinese history. And then the mentality, the 
ideology uh, believe was unique among the Qing elites. But the question is, you know, I'm thinking, looking at all the dynasties that were overthrown by peasant rebellion, you know, starting from the Qin dynasty, really, you know, the Qin dynasty was, was overthrown by a peasant rebellion. The Tang dynasty, as Tai Tzu said, was overthrown by the Huang Chao rebellion. The Yuan dynasty was, was overthrown by the Ming dynasty, which was a peasant rebellion. And then the Ming dynasty. So my question is, and then this is related to the graph I showed before, the, the decline in taxation started, didn't, didn't start in the Qing dynasty, started at least in the late Song and then in the Ming dynasty. So my question is, uh, why was Qing so unique, right? So why, why we didn't see, for example, in the Han dynasty, they didn't update based on what they saw to the Qin dynasty, for example. Okay, last question. Uh, there, are, there are many ways that you can stay in power, right? So the, the ultimate goal for the Qing elites is to stay in power. The, the ultimate goal is now to avoid peasant rebellion. Uh, there are millions of protests, so-called uh, 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 in China right now. You know, every year in China, contemporary China, there are millions of protests there, but the Chinese Communist Party stays in power. The reason they can stay in power is they have a very strong coercive capacity, right? So the, the, the ultimate goal of the Qing elites was to stay in power, not to avoid peasant rebellion. If that's the case, then why didn't they just increase taxation and then use the money for domestic coercion, right? They can, they can just use the money to increase public goods provision, but also that's what Rui Huang said. But then my, you know, my sense is they can also use it to really strengthen the military. And then also there are millions of protests every year, they can still stay in power. So, so why didn't they choose that strategy? Uh, I'll stop here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Yu Hua. Uh, Tai Su, because we actually only have 10 minutes before 12, uh, apparently probably we can extend it by 10 to 15 minutes afterwards. Uh, I probably I will invite you to briefly address the comments from the two commentators, and then we will open the floor and gather up probably a few questions before you respond to the audience. Okay, go ahead. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll be really quick and I'll, I'll move backwards um, just just because you want to ask a bunch of like uh, more specific empirical questions that I can answer more quickly. Um, thank you, Aziz and Yuhua, for those extremely uh, like very helpful, very deep, penetrating questions. I, I hope I can do them justice. Um, so, so Yuhua's question is: you know, Can totally explain China? So, like, my account is not an account of like like true macro history going all the way back to the Song. Like, I agree with Yuhua. Like, something else other than ideology was driving this long decline from the Song to the Ming uh, and then to the Qing. Uh, nonetheless, right, like if you look at basically qualitative fiscal behavior, the, the Ming resembles the Song much more than it does the Qing, right? Because like, as your own data shows, like after about like something around 1500, the Ming engaged begins to become like more fiscal expansions. Um, so that, like for the last 140 years of its existence, the Ming um, goes into kind of like a reformist expansionary mode. And it's partially successful at doing that. Um, and it, it manage, manages by, by, by all measures to kind of like, you know, so especially its silver income grows by a lot and the overall um, income, especially after 15, um, 15, 1581, um, expands by quite a bit. Right? So it never gets to some heights, which means that like something else is keeping it back that I'm not like, that, that's, that's not quite part of my story. Um, but it, like, it's not like the Qin, where the agricultural tax is treated as, as this like sacred cow that you can't touch, right? And that's the main difference, right? Because the, the, the Ming and the Qin comparison is in, in some ways like kind of a misleading one. So you know, if, if Ma Dobin were here, he would say basically that the decline from the Song to the Ming to the Qing is a natural product of economic and demographic expansion. Right? The, the Ming is a larger country than the Song is, the Qing is a larger country than the Ming is, and that natural expansion and the difficulty of like making sure ta making sure taxes are collected without massive levels of corruption with a larger economy means that you can only tax tax more lightly. And plus, you know, as you said, like uh, the, you know, the the Tilly thesis works in China as well. The Song fights many more wars than the Ming does. Now, the Ming doesn't fight more wars than the Qing does, right? But both the Ming and the Qing fight, you know, less wars than the, than the Song does, Song do and, and less wars than the Yuan does. So, like th those big demand side plus like rationalist supply side problems, um, probably combined together explain a lot of the decline that you're pointing to over very long periods of time. Like what I'm pointing to is a more specific phenomenon, where in the Qing, not only was there a continuation of this overall decline, but 
basically, you, you, for the first time in Chinese history, you see the land tax completely frozen in two centuries. Right? And that's the main thing, because even, even if you just loosen that, you allow the broad trend to climb, but you don't freeze the land tax, or right? you, you basically treat the land tax the same way the Ming treated it, would have meant the Qing would have been like, you know, quite a bit more fiscally powerful um, towards the later parts of its, its history, perhaps up to like 50% more fiscally powerful um, than it actually was. And that would have had a huge impact on how the final decades of the dynasty actually played out, including on what I care about really, which is the industrialization phase. Because like a, even like a 30% increase in agricultural taxes would have basically tripled the, the state's investment in industry. Um, during the Yang Wu phase. And that would have had major consequences for the divergent stories that I care about. Right? So, so like we're looking at different kinds of things and th therefore we're grappling for different kinds of explanations. But like, I, I don't disagree with you on the broad trends at all. It's just like, I'm not trying to explain that broad trend. Um, can, Chile, can Tilly explain China? Basically, you know, as we said, like up to a certain point, certainly yes, but you, you still run, run into the problem that the Ming taxes more heavily than the Qing, but the Ming actually fights fewer wars than the Qing does. And especially after 1850, the Qing fights as many wars as you almost see in the Song. Um, but it, it, it's, it still doesn't raise the agricultural tax. And so something, something malfunctions with the Tilly thesis. Um, with registered land, the Qing registered land includes places like the Northeast, includes like, you know, Heilongjiang, um, Liaoning, and so on and so forth. It doesn't really include the Northwest because that wasn't seen as part of like the proper tax base. Then those parts were also poor enough that they, they, they wouldn't have offered much in terms of um, fiscal income anyway, plus they were newly conquered. Um, the state's control over local population was weaker and so on and so forth. So th those weren't seen as very good taxes. Nonetheless, um, the, the Qing elites did think later on that you know, given that we can't tax anymore in the, in the Chinese which are more on the front. And they try some of that. After 1850, it just turns out that like that's not very cost effective given the nature of the economies over there. Um, and how, no, like why not more repression to deal with mass rebellions? Oh, and by the way, so, so, so the difference between the Zicheng's rebellion and Huang Chao is Huang Chao didn't actually kill off the, kill off the Tang Dynasty, right? The Tang Dynasty under the Tang Dynasty's banner puts down Huang Chao and Gao Xianzhu. And um, a few decades later, the dynasty dies formally to insurgencies of, of you know, military fiefdoms, right? That's different from the Zicheng who, who sacks Beijing and forces Chongzhen to commit suicide. Like that's the first time that, you know, that that's really happened um, and in at least like a thousand years, right? And the, the Yuan falls the peasant rebellions too, but again, because the Yuan was a Mongol conquering dynasty, the interpretation is different. Like what matters to me is not the existence, of, is not the actual existence of rebellion. It's how it's interpreted by the, by the elite. And that's where it's different. Like, you know, the, the, the Qing interpretation, interpretation of Ming rebellions was different from the way that the Ming elite interpreted the Yuan rebellions. One was seen as a failing of a barbarian conquest, foreign conquest, a foreign conqueror. The other was seen as an inherent failing of a civilized, fully sophisticated Han bureaucracy. And of course, like there's the shock to the system, like the shock to the, the intellectual mindset. Um, uh, of the literati is completely different because right? you can't blame the Mongols anymore for peasant rebellions killing off the Ming. Why not more repression? Well, I, I guess like the way they thought is that like, like the Ming was pretty darn sophisticated and had a, as large a domestic, uh, domestic military presence as the Qing did while facing a smaller population, right? So it'd be, it'd be incredibly risky to go down that path. If the Ming couldn't do it, there's a very large chance that we can't really do it either. And by the time, by the late Qing, right, the population is so far outstripped um, the state's administrative and control capacities, that nearly all of them think that like ramping up the state capacity to make sure the peasant rebellions are easily put down um, can't, be, can't be a viable strategy, especially given like how difficult it was to even put down the Taipei, which you know, if you, it was, was a massive thing, but if you measure it in absolute terms, it was far smaller um, than the peasant rebellions that actually brought down the main. And as a share of the population, right? So like, it just, they, they, they just get spooked. And the fact that they get spooked is actually part of the ideological story. Um, to Aziz, I think that Aziz raises a lot of really rich points. Like the American comparison really resonates with me. Like I think in many ways, a lot of what Trump is currently doing during COVID, like really to me reminds me of how the thing handled uh, land surveys, right? The team refused to, to, to do land surveys. Trump is refusing to, to test COVID. And um, like, you know, like the, the state's manipulation of, of, of information for, for blatantly political and ideological goals um, is, quite co is a common theme through, through Chinese, American, European history, and so on and so forth. 
Um, what does it say about imperial decline? Well, so this is the part where I would slightly push back a little. Like I, I tend to think that American imperial decline is, is of, a, of a different model than Chinese imperial decline. Uh, most, most, most visited because American, the, the American empire is of a fundamentally different characteristic than the Qing empire, uh, but also because like American elites are not going into American decline nearly as like informationally blindfolded um, as the Qing elite were. Right? The fact that you don't know the size of your economy is unthinkable um, in modern societies, e even with potential manipulation by politicians. Right? Like, you know, Americans have ad advanced warnings of uh, their decline. They, they know what's, they kind of know what's happening. The problems with the management of that is you know, entrenched, entrenched political interests um, and you know, like polarization and, and stratification and so on and so forth. It's not this kind of like willful ideological blindness that to me was the kind of like, well actually uh, there is quite a bit of willful ideological blindness in the American context, but it's not the willful empirical ideological blindness. Um, that, that, that I think is dominating the same context. And what is the nature of ideology? Um, I think, honestly, religions and racial theories, if they become systemic enough, are ideologies for me. Right? The, 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 the main distinction point between like a, 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 a culture, like a, a set of cultural beliefs that are vague and um, unorganized, and an ideology to me is first the ideology claims usually to be like more expansive in, in how much how much of the world it actually ex explains right like this is the reason why we call ideologies worldviews right? they inform nearly your entire political worldview um, as as the you know as as it clearly did in the same context where this was the cornerstone of all of, all of state policy making and everything else the state did and the elites believed and could be tied in some ways back to this. Right, the, the, you know, the ideologies have a comprehensive nature to them, but more importantly, they have like a, a, a well-ordered system to them. Right, like ideologies are systems. Ideologies are kind of like you know, like well-constructed um, hierarchies of beliefs that that mutually reinforce one another in a relatively kind of like rationalized fashion. Right, there's more logic. There's more internal logic to an ideology than I think there is internal logic to your usual kind of like cultural context. Um, and insofar as religions and racial theories meet that criteria, I would say they're, 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 they're actually ideologies. And the, the, the analogy that you draw to Odette's book, I think is spot on. Like, you know, like as you know, like I, I'm a huge fan of Odette's book. Um, and I, I think that you know, the way that she, she fleshes out like, you know, like um, sovereign debts, ideologies in the later 20th century, I think is like very much qualitatively similar to how I flesh out um, Seeing fiscal ideology right down to the reliance on kind of like a willful empirical blindness um, to a, a wide a wide stratum of like real world development. So like you know the the the, the, the massive empirical capturing effect of neoclassical economics and neoliberal economics is plays the same role I think in a, in you know that's uh, narrative as does like the the perception of Malthusian decline plays um, in my in my theory. Uh, finally, you know, like quickly, you know, what does it look up look like from the bottom up of the political ethics of fiscal um, strength? So yes, like I I'm looking at this from a kind of like a basic status person. I, I'm also looking at it from the per, the, the, the the perspective of the person of, of a person who thinks that um, the Qing's relative economic decline and the fact that it could, it could industrialize nearly as fast as Japan was a pretty catastrophic event in Chinese history. So like, those are some of my normative priors. But nonetheless, like, without going into the normativity, like, there is a, the claim is there's a causal connection between the lack of state capacity and relative economic decline, regardless of whether we think it's good or bad. Right? And so that's the, starting, that, that's the foundation of the book. Right? Nonetheless, from the bottom, the bottom up, like, honestly, yeah, like, even if peasants could pay more taxes, and you know, they could afford to pay 10 times Qing taxes in the early PRC, despite not really having much more wealth, Affording to pay taxes is not, it's not the same thing as like wanting to pay it, right? So, so this, the, the peasants won't usually rebel as long as they can afford things because rebelling carries the, the risk of death, obviously. Um, but they don't like it anyway. anyway. And you know, like they, they, they grumble some, in some parts, they resist in somewhat violent forms, but it's not widespread, right? So basically for the most part, the peasant perception uh, reaction is kind of like unhappy, but kind of like eye rolling acquiescence. Um, to a state that finally begins to tax a bit more heavily. 
heavily. Now, what does that mean for the normativity? Right, honestly, it depends on your normative worldview. Like if, you're, if you have the worldview of a good Confucian man, which I try to be, but, but I'm not really entirely that, um, then you would say that the, 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 the increase in taxes is a moral failure. Um, like I think it shows my personal moral feelings as a self about Confucian that I, I don't see it that way. Um, but it all depends on, on, on your normative priors. And I'm somewhat more status, and I, I, I fundamentally think that like, like, yeah, the state should have taxed more heavily. Perhaps there's a, there's a tipping point at which you begin to tax too heavily, and very arguably, you know, China may have reached that point right now. But like 1% of GDP, like, that's not, that, that's way on the other side of things. And so that would be like my basic normative intuition. Anyway, thank you for those questions. Um, if everyone's okay. willing to stay out for like 10 more minutes, I can start to try to answer some of these questions that I got. Okay, sure. Yeah, we are mindful of the time. I know one of our commentators at least has to, you know, knock yeah. off earlier for another event. But thank you both the, for the comments. And if Tai is willing to stay a bit longer, and sure. we actually yeah. I have, I have already forwarded some of the questions to your chat room, so you can right. take a so, look so, at So, so let, let me, because this thing is being recorded, and we're going to post this online anyway, right? So, so let, let, just for the sake of complete this, let, let me ask, like spend 15, 10 minutes ask, answering some of these questions, okay? Um, so the questions that I got from you are one from Joyman, one from Eric, and one from Yukiko. Um, Joyman's question basically is, uh, capacity still matters. Um, you know, like how does state capacity play a role in this? I don't deny that capacity plays, uh, I, I, thanks for, I mean, for the question. Uh, I agree, like I don't think capacity doesn't matter at all. Like capacity clearly matters, especially in the, in the kind of non-agricultural context where it matters hugely and keeping like seeing commercial taxes um, even after their, their, their rapid growth in the late 19th century lower than what they were say like in Russia or in Japan. Um, and in the agricultural tax, yes, capacity was a problem too. Um, but capacity wasn't so that you couldn't kind of sniff off in agricultural taxes, and that's the argument. Because because like like what I'm trying to explain is not slow growth; it's no growth. And I don't think capacity is enough to explain no growth. Capacity may well explain slow growth, but not no growth. Um, from Eric, what would the Qing have spent extra tax revenue on in 1800? Um, well, this is it's a good question. For the most part, you know, like just expanding the bureaucracy was something that most Qing officials thought that, that they probably should do, were it not for the fiscal constraints. Because the share of the bureaucracy as compared to the overall size of the population plummets at pretty much the same rate as taxes as a share of GDP. Because you can't pay, you can't have more officials than you can pay for, right? But you can't pay you, you can't pay for any more officials because you don't have any more taxes. So the the, the size of the team bureaucracy basically stays in place um, from like I don't know, 1700, 18, like six, 1680, all the way down to like eighteen fifty when they finally begin to expand the bureaucracy because they have to collect commercial taxes. Um, by seventeen seventy, basically, they know that the population is dramatically outpacing. The bureaucracy, right? Like the bureaucracy has less capacity on the ground, less control. Around 1800, after Tianlong dies and his son, the Zaxing Emperor, comes into power, um, there's a debate, of course, over the fact that we, we no longer have the bureaucracy to actually eff efficiently, effectively govern the population like we used to. So we have two choices. Right? We can either, you know, farm out more of our responsibilities to local, local self-governance by lineages and um, and guilds and so on and so forth. And that would allow us to keep the bureaucracy the same size, but we basically give up some of the state fun state's functionality or alternatively, um, we can raise taxes. And uniformly, everyone says, okay, we can't raise taxes. So we have to shrink the state, right? So what, like, what would they have spent the money on had they had more money? Well, they could have kept the state slightly more pace with population growth. And that was a big concern. Um, from Yukiko, uh, it's a long comment, so I'm not, because seeing ways to have live empirical data, how did they measure the economic well-being? Right. So this is the thing, right? so they had demographic data, but they didn't have economic data. Now, they know that the population is growing really, really fast, but they think the overall size of like food production capacity uh, of the economy stays relatively the same, right? So this is where the perception of deepening fiscal crisis um, actually comes, right? They know they're, well, well th this is where the perception of like Malthusian crisis comes, right? They think they're actually in a fiscal crisis too, because they're, they're in a Malthusian crisis. 
It turns out if you actually run the numbers, most modern scholars who have studied this, you know, Richard von Glan, uh, Ma Dobin, Lauren Franz, Hamrowski, everyone thinks, right, like there was really no such thing as a, as, as a serious Malthusian crisis. And the same way, like, not, like, you know, perhaps rural income declined very slightly, um, like very moderately from like 17, I don't know, what was the peak, it's like 1730 to 1840. But the, the, the decline was moderate, and given the you know, improvement of technological growth and, 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 and the kind of like the influx of like new, better crops and so on and so forth, overall living standards didn't really seem to decline uh, much, if at all, during that period, right? But from the state's point of view, you're, you're mired deep in a Malthusian crisis. And if you're in a, in a Malthusian crisis, that means like your taxable surplus, which is like total production minus the part that the population has to keep for itself to eat, is shrinking. And so that creates like the, 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 the presumption that like we're actually overtaxing. Like we're taxing the peasants more than at some point they're going to be able to pay us. And so we have to make every effort we can to keep agricultural taxes down. Now it turns out they can't afford to shrink it. So at the very the least they can do is keep it stagnant. And that's the that's the political that's the political consensus. Um, final questions. Can you please elaborate more on where and how you see political and historical agency and your story of information on in action or shift over time? All right. Um, so the historical agency of the Qing political elites, you know, like this is their own doing. At no point were they forced by external circumstances to have this mindset. And at no point were they forced to believe in Malthusian decline, even when actually there wasn't any such thing. Right? Like they brought it amongst themselves by, by, by giving up land surveying and by believing in all this stuff in the first place. Right? Now, it, that doesn't mean that what they did was like fundamentally irrational. Right? Like, it had any of us been thrown into their shoes, had we gone through the same things that had, they had gone through, had we taken up the same moment of fires, I don't think any of us would, can say with any kind of confidence that we, we would have done better than they did. But nonetheless, but right, insofar as ideology is a choice, right, they had that choice, and this is the choice they made. And I think that's agency. Um, so finally, um, some of the questions about this from the Xu Shuzhi folks, uh, they're asking about like what, what what is the impact of, of, of cash crops? I mean, cash crops make the, the rural economy in Qing larger, or right? like they, they're responsible for much of the growth um, on the ground of wealth in the Qing. And if you just look at food production, um, given the you know reclamation of land, where the Qing thought there was no reclamation, like Yuhua's um, data points are actually very interesting. Right, so he, he has one data point from like the the decade after after conquest, he has a data point from like the 1730s, and then he has a data point from 1907. 1907 is after they restart land survey. So by 1907, they know that the, the, the economy is better. But from like 1730, if you look at official figures, from, from 1730 to like 1880, the official figures on total land mass, the arable land mass in the empire remain completely unchanged. If anything, they actually like periodically shrink a little bit. Um, because the, the 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 state thinks that certain parts of land have become un like unusable because of overuse, right? So, um, but in, in reality, there was quite a bit of land reclamation, and the state begins to capture some of that after like 1890 when they start serving a little bit of land land again. And then they start serving land in Taiwan. They start serving land more in Manchuria, and there were, that's where the perceived growth was. The actual growth was even larger than that because in the Chinese core, like in the, these core macro regions, there was quite a bit of land, like land reclamation. So arable land mass grows, um, technology grows, land productivity goes up. Not necessarily labor productivity, but land productivity goes up. And so the overall kind of food production in the empire, plus um, the, the, you know, the, the increasing levels of foreign trade in the, the later 19th century, which brings some foodstuffs uh, into the country, there was no evidence of like a general food, so food shortage whatsoever. If you look at the actual economic data, no, I, I don't think any economic historian would actually say there was. Um, for the most part, which means that the introduction of cash crops in some parts of the economy was for the most part like a, a good thing. Um, for the agrarian economy, it just gave peasants more cash on hand, cash which the state in all its virtue never tried to take away from them. Um, so I, I think that's going to be my basic um, responses to the questions. We're at almost 12.15. I see a hand. Okay, um, I think we can probably have a last question. If yeah, so, so Marharan, if you want to have the last question, you can have it. If she's still here. 
So can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah. And so, uh, so thank you, Professor Zhang, for your wonderful speech. And I have a question that is, yeah, I totally agree that the tax rate in the Qing Dynasty was extremely low and the government, especially the local government, could only collect very limited tax revenues. But uh, I remember there are also some other scholars, they have pointed out that the, since the mid-Qing period, the local government of the Qing Dynasty tended to mainly rely on informal sources of revenues, like various kinds of surcharges on the patents and merchants. And in fact, the emperors and the intellectual elites, they were aware of the existence of this informal phys physical system in the local society. And so the question I wanna ask is that if the emperors and the intellectual elites, they didn't want to raise the raise the tax rate or expand the formal fiscal system because they thought that would threaten their rule. So mm -hmm. why they in the meantime tolerated the yeah. existence of this informal fiscal system and some extra legal surcharges in the local society? Because for the commoners, for the people, actually these two things were uh, no, the same. Yeah. Because yeah, because they, yeah. they need to pay more tax to the government. Exactly right. So so, so it's it's a, it's a great question. It's the question that I tried to kind of briefly flag during the talk. Um, informal search has become a major thing in the Qing, basically from like 1680 onwards. Right, like that's the point at which this, the the bureaucracy begins to stagnate and population starts to grow really fast. So like by 1720, everyone knows that like local governments can't function anymore just on their formal tax base, right? Like, they, like you will never have the administrative capacity to actually govern on the ground just based on formal taxes. So to some extent, the reason this sense was they like raising formal taxes, like, like well, assume that they didn't want to raise formal taxes, formal taxes were not enough to actually allow for like a really low level of functionality on the ground. Nonetheless, right, like by the best estimates that we have, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like from the 17, say like 30s um, to the 1820s to like 1900, the overall volume of informal taxation grew that much, right? So what that meant was that like local governments were charging informal taxes to make, to, to like make their own ends meet, to like basically have some functionality. Um, but because the, like, even the informal taxes weren't growing, that meant that their functionality vis-a-vis -vis the, the overall population was shrinking steadily. And after 1800, the formal call was made from the top down to, like, basically just, like, give more, like, if we can't have local governments assume more, assume enough administrative functionality, we have to let lineages rule themselves more, right? So, the, like, most Chinese governments Chinese imperial dynasties are deeply suspicious of local self-governance because it's a threat to their rule. But the Qing is the only one, I think, that really aggressively encourages lineage self-governance after the dynasty and it does this um, because it has no other way to rule unless it actually wants to raise taxes. Now then the question becomes, why do local governments raise informal taxes more so that they can have more functionality? And this is the part where you, know, you want to think more kind of like theoretically about what are the conditions for local governments to actually be able to raise informal taxes, where informal taxes are illegal, right? The central government will acquiesce to their collection up to a certain point, but beyond a certain point, they're gonna crack down and they, they do crack down multiple times. So they're, they're illegal, which means you have to collect them outside of sight of like, like beyond the, the, the site of the central, the central government. Now you can collect them coercively. Like you can force local governments, lo the local population to pay you more informal taxes. But the thing with the Qing is by something like 1750 or 1760, right, like the, the administrative capacity on the ground is so weak that it's not clear at all that local bureaucrats have the coercive capacity to force local populations to pay them more taxes. Right? Because like, you know, coercion would mean bringing in some kind of coercive force, perhaps like the local military bastions or the militia, but that would risk 
making the central government aware that you're trying to like, raise informal taxation, which for the most part, the central government doesn't want you to do. Like it's willing to allow you a certain, a certain basic code and turn a blind eye. If you go any further than that, they think you're risking their, their stability and legitimacy, right? So you what that means is at some point, the coercive capacity, right? The, the, you know, like with population growth, yes, the central government's ability to monitor local agents weakens. But at the same time, with massive population growth, the local agents' coercive capacities vis-a-vis -vis the local population also declines. So with those two things put together, it's not quite clear whether with massive population decline, a bureaucrat on the ground in 1820 was actually better positioned than somebody in 1720 to collect informal taxes, right? Like he, he likely had weaker coercive force, um, coercive capacity at, a, at, at, at his hand um, than his 1720 predecessor, which means that like the, the collection of informal surcharges has to be done somewhat consensually um, with the local population. And the local population is willing to pay informal taxes up to a certain point because they want to have a functional local government. Right, so they'll acquiesce to paying you beyond the formal tax because they don't want like the local yamen to like not be able to do anything. But right? after all, that they use local yamen for litigation cases, some certain kinds of administrative coordination. So they're willing to pay up to a certain level, but but like they're not willing to pay you beyond what they're willing to pay you. So when you rely on the consent of the local population that is increasingly self-governed um, to generate your informal surcharges, well. Not, I, I don't think it's that surprising that the informal surcharges don't grow very quickly, if really at all, um, throughout much of the dynasty. And that keeps the overall level of real extraction from, the, from, from, from agriculture uh, pretty much unchanged. 